January 31st, and it's uh, 8.31 a.m., and we're going to start the meeting currently. So the first thing that we have, number one, are the review and adopt the minutes from the previous meeting, October 25th. Do I have a, any discussion? Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right. Next is the administrative update. Uh, so the, I wanted to start off first by introducing you all to Robert Smith, our new staff attorney. Um, we are thrilled to have Robert. We had, as you know, many really qualified candidates apply for the position, and um, Robert has incredible wealth of experience. Um, while he was at the Travis County DA's office in particular, he's tried loads and loads of felony cases. He has uh, been in the appellate division. He's worked on some of the trickiest and thorniest, most difficult issues that that office has faced. And by all accounts, from both the defense attorneys we spoke with and the prosecutors, has handled those things with tremendous integrity. He's fascinated with forensic science. Um, so he's a great fit for us. And I just wanted to introduce you to him and give a formal welcome in front of everyone. So you're welcome. Okay. So um, you can see that there's a budget status report in your materials. Um, there's you've already approved this budget, but we give you sort of the we always try to give you the ongoing update. Um, does anyone have any? questions about that and of the things on there. It is it does reflect the addition of Robert's salary and related overhead. Um, so you can see that the salary portion of expenses is higher than it than it was. Now that we've got it. Any questions? No, I'd have a question if it wasn't increased. <laughs> <laughs> He said he works for free. He loves it so. Um, so that's all I have. Lee, do you have anything else? I don't know if you wanted to give an update on our efforts with IT at OCA to create a database of forensic analysts and accredited labs. We're working with them. I don't know if you know more than I do about it. So there are three different databases that we're trying to get OCA to help us out with that they're working on. One is a um, sort of a more sophisticated way to show the status of all the licensees. So you can really see, right now we have this spreadsheet that you can click on that has very detailed data, thanks to Rodney, our um, licensing specialist. But we're also trying to do a database for corrective actions, which is something that we've talked about, and they're working on that, and what they're gonna do is we're going to start, I think, with DPS and HFSC because theirs are already available online. And we're going to bring those over and have like a Google search function. So if people are looking for certain things, they can. We'll see how that goes. And then we'll 
add the material we have from the other laboratories. And that's something that uh, Mr. Daniel had, has been asking for for a while. We're just trying to get, get our IT project nudged up higher on the list of very many IT projects that the Office of Court Administration has. Like the statewide case management system and things like that. <laughs> Um, but they tell me they're working on it, so we should have a good report next time. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right, so number three is going to be the pending complaints. Yes, sir, Dr. Bernard. We have um, 15 matters. Uh, one is the self disclosure that's a folder from August to October, and seven new self disclosures and seven new complaints. The, uh, Compliance Disclosures Committee did not actually meet yesterday as we sometimes do, largely because there are some other matters that might have taken us some time, but also nothing was too complex. <laughs> but uh, the first matter is a self-disclosure out of 19.26 uh, out of the EPS office lab involved in the top section two calibrator from morphine did not meet acceptance criteria. And there were five additional batches uh, discovered in the investigation, which essentially affected about 50 cases. Um, staff had made a recommendation back in December. Uh, as of December 23, DPS was still working on a final quality instant report. Staff had made a recommendation. We actually actually tabled that pending finalization of that report, which I concur with. Um, any thoughts, comments, or questions? I Brady, do you have anything on it? Uh, we've, we've completed all of our action items. We completed them this week. Uh, we do not have the actual document to submit. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we need to table that to submit the document, that doesn't make sense. Dr. Kerr, did you have I don't think we can uh, adjudicate this until those uh, documents. So motion to table. So there's a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, Bernard, if I can, I'm going to recuse from this and the, all of the DPS <coughs> cases. Okay. All right. So, so our second matter is a uh, case number 19.42 from DPS Midland, uh, Seized Drugs uh, Division. An evidence technician actually destroyed some controlled substances that have not actually been analyzed. They set about to do their uh, destruction. They had laboratory evidence technicians actually pulled the case in 19.91 shelf instead of 02691. So the last two digits of each evidence item were the same. Uh, it involved less than a gram of a suspected controlled substance. They discovered it been destroyed. They done their root cause analysis and essentially determined it was a miscommunication between the two technicians. Uh, they notified <coughs> all the agencies. Uh, they've made some changes that uh, should remedy that in the future going forward. Uh, staff, who always does a wonderful job viewing these, have recommended that we take no further action out of the corrective actions, by the notification the agencies involved, and the change in the destruction of processes. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? If not, I would make a motion to take no further action in the case of 19.42. Is there a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Which brings us to the third matter, case number 199.43, which is a little bit different than what we commonly encounter. It came out of the Barrett County Criminal Investigation Laboratory. There was a uh, trace evidence supervisor, Mike Martinez, who ended up doing a podcast in relation to a Mississippi case. Uh, and in the podcast, he made some representations about all uh, his qualifications, <coughs> expertise, and also some things with regard to the uh, conclusions drawn. And frankly, the lab director even found those things to be somewhat inaccurate. What's curious about it is it was a matter that involved a, a Mississippi case, not a Texas case. Uh, just turns off some Barrett County was appropriate in developing a memorandum of disclosure at all. Council uh, regarding uh, Mr. Martinez. Um, I saw where staff sort of struggled with this and realized it's outside the scope of Texas. Uh, but we do have licensing issues and certainly uh, professional responsibility uh, matters in, in 
connection with that. So they had recommended uh, a letter from the Forensic Science Commission to Mr. Martinez upon us taking no further action that at least apprised him that we were aware of it and uh, certainly future instances might be uh, viewed especially uh, more critically if they involve Texas matters and Texas cases, which I would certainly concur with. Thoughts, ideas, or comments? I have a question on it. Is, <coughs> although it's not directly a Texas case, doesn't it affect the integrity of the expert if there's any testimony? Yes, if he's so licensed by us now. Yeah, and that indirectly would affect cases? So when we were thinking about it, <clears throat> part of the challenge is that it's a podcast. <laughs> that Mr. Martinez maintains is basically entertainment and him sort of talking about a case where he wasn't, I mean, it's not, he wasn't called as a witness. He didn't do any analysis. He wasn't retained to work the case in any way. It's more of a, I mean, as the way he poses it to us, sort of a First Amendment issue that he should be able to do these sort of entertainment type podcasts. Now, one could question his judgment in doing that and whether or not it's a good idea to get on there and talk about the cause and manner of death when you're not a pathologist and all that sort of thing. But um, I just feel uncomfortable with the idea that we would take action against his license in Texas for a podcast that he was on about a Mississippi case when, you know, the case was a question of whether it was a suicide or a homicide, and they declined to prosecute. No, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just wondering if there's any other impact because of the licensing that we should consider in this situation, as he is, the licensing is part of that. I don't know. I, I agree with you. I think anybody, if he's just doing his entertainment, he could have been just, you know, fabricating it for storytelling and that it may not really mean anything. But, I think the bigger issue here is that, because I completely agree with Lynn, I, there's very little we can do with this in terms of licensing, but I think it highlights a really important point, and that is that probably we need to go back and look at our code of professional responsibility, which is very specific for Texas, and modify that. Because if you look at it um, from this standpoint, if when we limit it to um, uh, professional responsibility just within the state, we're almost encouraging our licensed examiners to be unprofessional in other states. Why would that expectation of professional responsibility just be limited to the state of Texas? So I think if we resolve that issue, that would be useful. Which could be, which could be included in a letter, you saying? Yeah, I mean, I think it highlights probably a, a loophole um, in our code of so, professional responsibility. So going back to the statutory authority, which is really important, because um, that's what says what we can and cannot do, it says that on a determination by the commission that a license holder has committed professional misconduct under this article or violated this article or a rule or order of the commission under this article, the commission may revoke or suspend, refuse to renew, or reprimand. And so um, reprimanding could be, you know, something more formal in terms of process than the letter that we suggested. It could be something like a um, censure or something like that in the future. I'm not saying in this case that that's appropriate, but we could think a little bit more about what we mean or what the law says when it says reprimand and, and talk about how to make that a little more specific in the rules. Um, but I, you know, for this particular case, I mean, it is clear that professional misconduct is contemplated with respect to forensic analysis. And forensic analysis is an expert examination or test on physical evidence for the purpose of connecting the evidence to a criminal action. And a criminal action is a very broad definition, but these are Texas cases, you know. And so as much as I'm not thrilled with that type of speculation by any of our community out there in any state um, in terms of what actions we can take given the rules and the statute right now, I think they're very, very limited. 
And then I think that that would need to be changed because your cross-examination of the expert isn't limited to Texas cases or forensic analysis. So they're going to be crossed on this. I mean, so I think it is, yeah, and, and the fact that you don't examine something and you're still making expert opinions on it is even worse than actually examining it and then making it and, um, making your opinion. So whatever we need to do to fix that, we gotta we gotta fix that because you're right. We don't want to encourage people to go and certificate on things outside of their fields, outside of the state. Um, they shouldn't be doing it anywhere because it can come back to bite them and, frankly, the prosecutor and the victim in a particular case later on on an unrelated issue because that's coming back. I mean, that's coming back to bite him and whatever agency is dealing with that. So, I mean, I think it's clear that the Bear County DA's office ha is going to have to wrestle with this whenever he is sponsored as a witness. Right, but whoever else feeds into Bear County. So, for example, I don't know if there's any other agencies that use that particular, that use Bear County Laboratory, who, I have no idea about that. We have the lab director here. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Is it, do we not have the lab yeah. yeah, okay. I'm Orrin Doom. I'm the uh, director of the Bear County Crime Laboratory. So, could I actually get the question again that you'd like Just, to ask? Um, if you have anything further to contribute about the analysis you did in, in reviewing this. So my take on it is, and looking at it, Mr. Martinez was clearly advertised as a forensic expert there to evaluate evidence and offer an expert opinion. That is the advertisement in the podcast itself and how he is built. Um, Mr. Martinez did so. He, he offered, uh, based on his written partial, evidence he offered his opinions um, there was some uh, if you will uh, modifiers up front if he was not an expert uh, it's most certainly not what we intend for our analysts uh, as a director I expect our analysts to hold to ASCLAD laboratory and forensic science commission codes of conduct whenever acting as an expert in forensics whether it be in our employee or not uh, I think our policies were short on holding to that standard and we're working on correcting that. Uh, I think itself it's a very unusual situation. Uh, I felt I felt that it required being reported to the Commission. I even in my disclosure commented I'm not sure that it is within the Commission's jurisdiction but I felt it's an important issue. As to whether or not non bear County agencies utilize the crime laboratory, yes. <coughs> we have accepted cases from agencies throughout the state of Texas. We even accept cases in Trace in particular from outside the state of Texas. Fee for service. I like to refer to it as cost sharing. Cost sharing. <laughs> 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 the crime laboratory's budget is not dependent upon the fees collected. Our budget is set separately by the county, so there is no correlation between fees collected and our budget. That's why I call it cost sharing. <laughs> I think we should call it that from now on. <laughs> Mark, if, I'm, if I may, uh, we could uh, certainly then a letter possibly between yourself, Lynn, and myself, <laughs> and incorporate all the comments that Mr. Martinez knows about the, the focus of the commission that <clears throat> that would take care of the things that were. Yeah, this doesn't right. preclude a, an attorney in a trial asking about it, and that may be the way that that is dealt with. I still think it's important that we go back and revisit our That may be, but I think right now. The, the other thing, just for the record, is that even though it appears that this commission doesn't have um, authority or jurisdiction to address it, it does it does appear to violate you know the ANAV, ANAV guiding principles of professional responsibility and potentially other professional codes of ethics for professional organizations. So there are other authoritative bodies that may choose to take it up, and it may fall within within their scope. So it, um, that's just something else. All right, so we uh, do we have a motion for no further action and a letter? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries.
Takes us to our fourth matter called DPS uh, Amarillo uh, Seized Drug uh, Section. Involved in a missing drug paraphernalia case, uh, essentially missing evidence. Uh, a related case that was actually a felony matter that did not, uh, was not missing from the ball. Uh, I personally would like to commend Amarillo Labs. We deal with felony matters and class A and misdemeanor matters. They make the disclosure here out of a class C case, which is what the statute contemplates they must do. And <coughs> they assess the root, root cause, and determine it's possible the envelope was inadvertently discarded in the receiving process. Uh, I'm not totally clear on that, but they, uh, they have taken corrective actions to make sure it does not occur again. Staff would recommend it. We take no further action, which I would concur with. Any thoughts, comments, or ideas? I have a general thought about we have seen, <clears throat> I think, a spike in disclosures from DPS on the question of evidence handling generally. And I just want to confirm, Brady, my impression is that this has a lot to do with the full system vault law. So that's why we're seeing these things come forward. But can you talk sure. about that? A um, number of years ago, uh, we really took a step back and, and used a couple different mechanisms to look at the controls we have over evidence. And uh, we used our own internal auditors from the department and our own staff. And ultimately, one of the corrective actions through that process, because we did have some drugs that were missing, um, was that we would do a 100% vault audit. So that did start in uh, 2019. And this is actually based on that. So all of our laboratories have gone through 100% vault audit in 2019. And at times we're finding that kind of all the things that may have been misbarcoded or things in this case that were missing, uh, this is the misdemeanor portion of this case, um, we're catching up on all that. And so that's why we've got kind of this uh, multiple disclosures in this space over the last two weeks. Well, I think that's a really important point. And I think all of us who reviewed the the documents this time saw that five of the six new sub-disclosures were based on evidence handling, which sometimes gets the least amount of attention in the lab because, um, you know, it might be perceived as the grunt work and it's actually the most important work that happens in the lab. Um, but I think um, when you read the materials, it was clear that the fact, the number of disclosures that we're seeing is directly related to the fact that the audits that are being conducted at DPS are working and are not just superficial in nature, they're actually identifying um, those issues. So that's a very good thing. Okay. So I would respect to make a motion to take no further action with regard to our self-disclosure 19.45. Yes, I'm Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Which would bring us to our fifth matter. It involves uh, NMS Labs, Graham Curry. Uh, it's certainly a serious matter with extensive professional misconduct uh, regarding seized drugs. The analyst, Ms. Almond, had been found to engage in appropriate, inappropriate manipulation of data during a conference test on a quantitative procedure. And when confronted, uh, readily admitted to that, uh, actually said something to the effect of, I had a lot of other things to get done. So she manually uh, integrated the controls. The uh, lab removed her from casework, uh, began their internal investigation, and in early October made a decision uh, involving termination. Uh, they reviewed 22 of her cases up to this point. Um, NMS has disclosed everything to the affected parties. Uh, the root cause they essentially found was analyst's choice to in that behavior. Um, staff have reviewed this and made a recommendation that we begin an investigation to assess whether professional misconduct is supported. Um, well, I guess this would lead to a question, what, what else can we, we can do in an investigation? So, we, I think we would ask for uh, more material and we would <clears throat> reach out to the analyst to see if she'd like to speak with us. Uh, we would sort of start the process of uh, investigating, giving her an opportunity to give her side of the story. And ultimately, you know, since the laboratory has found professional misconduct, that triggers a licensing uh, disciplinary action on our part. So, um, 
It's, so it's, we have to follow due process for this. Right, we're now here in Washington. We really haven't had the matters that involve the clear case of this conflict previously, so we need to decide how that's going to be done by committee or entire panel. Well, we had the Fort Worth PD one. Yes. With the DNA, with the tray, and mm -hmm. the garbage. That one. And in that case, the way it went was the laboratory issued their finding, their internal, their inspector general, whatever, Fort Worth PD, also did an investigation. They released a report. We reviewed all of that material. We agreed with the findings. We reached out to the uh, analyst, and ultimately she resigned her license voluntarily, and she's no longer in the field. I think um, we just need to, I think we need to create an investigative panel decide which documents and other, uh, you know, interviews or anything else you want to do, and then go through the process. We have to notify her that that's what we're doing. Do we have anybody from NMS who wants to say anything regarding this? Uh, there has been uh, approximately 70 cases that have been reviewed. Uh, we have not seen any uh, instances of, this, of the misconduct that uh, we detected in our uh, technical review of the case that in question uh, so we have not um, seen we think that this is probably an isolated incident or that's what we can uh, have determined so far um, there's like I said there has been uh, about 70 cases that have been reviewed how long was that analyst at the laboratory Approximately two and a half, three years. Is there a way to figure out how many Texas cases the analyst has worked on? Can you do like a query in the limbs or something? Well, she was in Texas, so. Oh, she was physically here, that's right. I, so, right, Grand Prairie. Sorry. So, all the Texas, Texas cases. Yeah, all, all pretty well, much. I don't all. think exclusively, but I would say Almost a, a great percentage, 90%. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot that. So, so this wasn't during competency testing for the quantitation of THC versus marijuana. Correct. So it was not during casework. It right. was it was a competency test. And I think it was not for the quantitation. I think it was for the decision point, the new decision point assay at NMS. Correct. Right. We yes. we call it the hemp uh, marijuana differentiation. Right. That one, our favorite one. Um, <laughs> so the I guess the issue there is. Um, it seems from what you all described that the shortcuts that were taken were done to get through the competency test. Yes. So do we know about, is there any reason to believe that any other competency test that she may have taken, she rushed in a similar way or shortcutted? We have not been able to find any other um, instance of the, the similar uh, type of um, behavior. Uh, this was caught on technical review and um, like Dr. Karen Boone was saying earlier, the system is working. You know, our, our quality system is working. But um, no, we have not been able to detect any other instance uh, where she had done this. But although she hadn't, she wasn't actively doing casework for that SOP because she'd been at the lab a couple of years you you went back and looked at her her casework for other methods well at the time that method was not up and going right but as part of the other cases that you reviewed those were cases other than this SOP correct this was sort of a lapse in judgment issue mm -hmm. uh, a major lapse in judgment so and I think those are the documents that the panel will need yeah we'll, we'll yeah and this isn't going to be one of the more difficult no. panels uh, to adjudicate. <laughs> <No. laughs> I don't think so well, we want to include uh, three folks to com comprise this panel as part of the motion for the investigation. We'll yeah, I think we should have three people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, first of all, um, wait a minute, first of all, we got to vote are we going to do a panel or not. So, okay. may, oh, I sorry, ask, yes, may I add one more thing on behalf of NMS? Uh, we actually have this, uh, we reviews. We have received a subpoena uh, indicating that she may be in a courtroom next week. Uh, mm -hmm. We have um, done a thorough review of files 
uh, including her file for Brady, Giglio, Michael Morton disclosures. Uh, I'm working on that today and we are well aware of those requirements as we go forward in the casework and, and I'm working with our Director of Human Resources to make sure while we don't compromise rights, we are uh, meeting those obligations. Thank you. All right, so is there a motion to create a panel? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? So now we get to who's on the panel. Well, I'll volunteer because be I'm just going to anyway. be volunteered by <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Two, three, ten. All right. Okay. So we got so, it's very really bold to do this time. <laughs> Mark. Who was it? Uh, sure. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to take a vote on that? I'm sure you'll get it. Sure. Yeah, I don't think there'll be anybody fighting about the panel. Uh, but so, is there a motion to accept the three members for the investigative panel? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I didn't think anybody was going to want to insert themselves to uh, another panel. All right. Which will take us to our six matters, case number one nine point five and one. It comes out of Austin PD Forensic Services Bureau, and similar issue with regard to the intake of, of evidence and repackaging. Uh, an analyst, while repackaging evidence, discovered two items in one case uh, incorrectly labeled called THC. Item two had been analyzed. And it was reported the report is item number four. Uh, mistakes happen. The, Travis County DA's office uh, was notified. Uh, the case has not been subject to litigation. Other police agencies in the area were also notified. They determined three main causes uh, related to the process, followed by the analysts, writing reports, closing cases. Secondly, another contributing factor was the different evidence labeling practices by the different agencies. And I think there's an effort ongoing to make that a little bit more uniform. It really had no negative impact on the case, according to the lab. And they have taken steps to require analysts to visually verify item labels prior to during the case closing process. Uh, staff had uh, made a recommendation for no further action, uh, which I will concur with. Any thoughts, comments, or ideas? If not, do we have a motion to take no further action? I will make a motion to take no further action. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I, I think one of the things that's highlighted in this complaint is that it's a lot more difficult for DPS to manage those issues because they're dealing with multiple agencies. If you're in a county lab or a city lab and you're, you have a relatively small number of agencies that you're partnering with that you're receiving evidence from, you can address those training issues very easily. And this complaint really highlights some of those challenges because you've got so many agencies that are being served by DPS and when you have the need to retrain those officers on how to properly submit evidence, that's a lot more challenging. And that's just common to all state labs throughout the United States. It's just more difficult than smaller county or city labs. It's to be expected that you're going to see more complaints that relate to that type of issue. This was just to be clear, self-disclosure. I'd like to say that because it's the laboratory's bringing it to us. Uh, so that's Which would bring us to the seventh matters, case number one nine point five two. Uh, was there a vote? I'm sorry. There was a vote. Yeah, okay. Before, pardon me, Mark. I'm sorry. You what? Please wake her up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, case number 19.52, DPS Abilene. Uh, it was filed just for the end of last year. It involved uh, 71 missing tablets that were discovered in a system wide uh, vault audit. Uh, as part of the audit, the lab had conducted physical inspection of all the packaging seals, and there were some items from many years back. Uh, the lab identified five cases where the seals required reinforcement. Not necessarily a red flag based on the exterior of all storage conditions, the age and the heat uh, in the lab. In one case, the tape was even peeling, actually peeling apart. Uh, the case had been closed without analysis, and the tablets were actually never tested. So, what we have is some 
degradation, I guess. But uh, the lab said about its analysis, they attempted to identify the underlying factors which contributed to missing evidence. <coughs> and they recalled a matter back in 2015 that involved some missing pills and tablets, uh, which was reported to the commission at the time. And that laboratory employee had suddenly resigned and been subject to criminal prosecution. Uh, the lab determined several factors uh, may have contributed to this case not being discovered back in the 2015 audit and it set about to uh, make corrections to ensure that does not happen again. Uh, more importantly, these drug cases were, with regard to the cases closed down analysis, they were more closely examined those in the future. It's not to be humorous, but all these seem to involve uh, by the code on the cares program, so it is uh, The staff recommended on their review that we take no further action. A lot of disclosures made, the sub notification review, and the corrective actions. Uh, it sounds like a lot of problems out there. But any thoughts, comments, ideas? Um, I wanted to ask Bernie, so <clears throat> we, I mean, we were obviously familiar with what happened when it was discovered and you all did an audit at the time. And can you just further elaborate on <coughs> yep. which category of cases that wasn't captured then you're, yeah. you're looking at now? So in 2015, we did an audit around missing evidence that occurred in our Appling Laboratory. And um, as was mentioned, there was a, uh, an employee that left our service and then was, was uh, dealt with through the court system as well based on that, that missing evidence. Um, as part of that corrective action, we did look at uh, their, the method that they would identify the compounds that were being stolen um, was that they were tested, they knew the result, and they were looking at our limb system, identifying the cases, and they were going to take and remove the pills from those cases. Um, we didn't actually look at, when we did the audit back in 15, cases that were in our care that were closed without no analysis. That was the, the, this particular case was in that um, uh, holding pattern. Uh, it was submitted by our CID, which is our criminal investigation division. It was submitted to us and then it was uh, told to us not to analyze it because it wasn't needed. Uh, but then we do not have a destruction order, so we've been retained that since about, I think it was about 2012 or 2011. Uh, so we didn't actually catch that in the audit back in 15. So when we went through the 100% vault audit in 19, um, we did identify that there was some packaging out of our outside vault. Uh, Any time the tape is, um, uh, appears to be compromised, we do a full inventory of that case, and that's when we realized the hydrocodone was missing. Um, so we have, uh, our root cause is pointing back to the event that happened in 19, and then we've asked both our Office of Inspector General and the uh, Ranger Division to follow up. Uh, they've completed their investigation and preparing a report. Um, but the preliminary result from both those groups is that it does align with where our corrective action is here. Okay. What's the status of the case? Uh, the, the case itself is, is there's, there's no prosecution on the case. Uh, it's not needed for court. We uh, talked to the DA and our CID agents. So uh, <coughs> the will not be prosecuted. We're, we're waiting for destruction order from our CID agents, so it will be destroyed. And then the, the changes that you've made to accessing the drug evidence, who can go in the vault? Yeah, we have a two-person rule since that, uh, mm -hmm. since those events back in 15, and so two people have to be present in the vault. Uh, there are certain individuals that only have access to vaults. Um, we used to have like a two-person rule for different areas, but our entire drug rules are now two-person. Um, we're doing 100% vault audit. We have also are working both with the Texas Highway Patrol and our CID agents to try to eliminate the evidence and get it out of our laboratories as quick as we can. And that's been kind of cool the last couple of years. Is it electronic so that they have to swipe to go in so you know who's going in? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's all logged, uh, proxy cards on all the vaults, and we have cameras in the vaults as well. Motion take no further action. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Which will bring us to eighth matter, it's case number one nine point five four comes out of the Ashton County Regional Crime Lab involved a controlled substance uh, envelope with three plastic bags inside the envelope were tested. There appears to have been a fourth item that was stuck probably to a piece of uh, inside the envelope that is on 
taken out. The original analyst simply missed the fourth item, failed to inventory, and also failed to analyze it. And uh, I was certainly cursed by this. The lab determined the root cause was lack of visibility. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, their cure all is that the packaging will be open a matter that allows for a complete thorough inspection of all evidence I'm seeing inside. They determined this was isolated rather than systemic, which is good. Mistakes happen. It sound like it'll happen again. So, any thoughts or comments? Uh, staff has made a recommendation to take no further action, uh, which I concur with. I'll make that as a motion. Yes. 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 Any further discussion? Uh, is there a motion? Uh, motion to take no further action. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Which will take us to our, our comments. <coughs> and uh, our first comes from Mr. Torres. Uh, he's alleging some serology testing conducted in the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences. His shoes did not establish whether the stains were presumptive for animal blood or human blood. He made a request to the commission the shoes be retested. If the position of the stains were not uh, even blood. Um, the uh, staff obtained all the lab reports, photos, the DNA extraction logs. Uh, the reports reflect the same information that was introduced at trial, which was consistent. There was really no finding of DNA on the swabbing of the shoes. So uh, staff made a recommendation to dismiss this for failure to clearly state or allege an allegation of. Uh, professional negligence or misconduct and we really don't have authority to order retesting by anybody so uh, thoughts ideas or comments if not i'd make a motion to dismiss second second all those in favor Aye. opposed uh our tenth matter is complaint from joseph scott station number 19.44 comes out the eps waco we follow the uh, <coughs> unit the defendant Filed a complaint list of David's misconduct by DPS Waco for sexual assault evidence in his case. Uh, he was very vague about alleging any specific facts that would support uh, any allegation of misconduct or negligence for that matter. Our staff got the case file. DPS letters of the Harris County Public Defender's Office states the case may benefit from reinterpretation. Uh, the matter's been referred to the DNA mixture review team. They're going to do a recalculation. Staff is recommending dismissal on the basis of the bill of any specific allegations of negligence for misconduct and also the DNA mixture review team. And I would concur with that. Thoughts or comments? Uh, Bob's here. Yes, ma'am. You want to say anything? Uh, <coughs> yeah, the Waco lab is in the process of recalculating this one. Okay. DPS lab. <coughs> Thank you. So, motion to dismiss. Second. Are there all those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Which will bring us to our 11th matters, case number 19.47. Uh, Charles Lee complains against Wyatt <coughs> Jean, which is uh, no longer in existence, about a false report uh, from the defense expert, Megan Schaffer, that since she testified, she conducted a thorough review of the state's DNA file. And it says she did not. Um, he was actually representing himself. He had standby counsel to, uh, I guess, counsel with him as he represented himself. Um, staff requested copies of the original case file from DPS. DPS responded with a log of activity. It showed production of the complete case file to the prosecutor and to the defense both. Um, we don't really have much jurisdiction to it. it really fails alleging credible claim of professional bankruptcy or professional misconduct. The staff made a recommendation of dismissal, which I would respectfully concur with. I'll make that as a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And that would bring us to our 12th matters, case number 19.48. Bill uh, Darden is complaining against uh, Harris County. Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, 
he is essentially saying that the forensic pathology analyst Joseph Matthews testified falsely at his trial regarding sexual assault. Uh, he alleged there was no sperm or semen detected, and any testimony related to some DNA profile from that would have been a, uh, a false representation. Staff went to work. Staff got all the laboratory reports related to the case from the district attorney's office in Houston. They showed a presumptive test for seminal fluid was positive or not, and the same detected on a different item of the sexual assault evidence. A male DNA profile was generated that did not exclude the defendant. Um, there was no statistical weight that was provided with it. I think that Mr. Wyckoff is doing a DNA mixture interpretation review of my question. On Darden? Yes, sir. Candidly, it rings a bell. I need to check. <laughs> Um, Gerald, do you have anything on Durden? Yeah, so this is uh, Gerald Doyle on behalf of the Harris County District Attorney's Office. So this is a Chapter 64 that was filed pro se over a year ago, court appointed an attorney for Mr. Durden. He's a serial, very prolific writer. Uh, he's up to I on his writs. He's already been, after the fifth writ, the Court of Criminal Appeals uh, found that he was abusing the process. Nonetheless, um, he had testing that was done pre-trial, uh, way back when, on a sexual assault. IFS did the testing. Uh, when he filed his pro se motion, I reached out to IFS to say, is there, are there any newer testing techniques available? Is there anything that would substantiate additional testing? And IFS said, we're willing to test it. We think it may be a good idea, not necessarily because we think we'll get a different result, but because the original testing didn't come up with population statistics, so we think we we would be willing to retest it. I reached out to his attorney and said, and that was over a year ago, and said IFS is willing to retest. We're willing to submit the property to IFS for retesting. Um, I have yet to get a response, an answer. I reached out again three weeks ago when this complaint was filed, and I was made known aware of it again. I reached out. Then in between, he filed another writ. When I reached out to his attorney three weeks ago and said, look, the offer is there. We're happy to test. IFS is willing to test. What do you want to do? And she said, I'll get back to you. And that's where it stands. Uh, so it really is their, their burden. And uh, I'm waiting for the attorney to either tell me they're willing to have IFS mm -hmm. proceed or not. And if they're not, I don't believe it fits within the Chapter 64 requirements. So we may move to deny it, but at this point in time, we're willing to test. Robert, you spoke with his attorneys. Yes. And she said similar to what she told him. Exactly the same thing. Uh, he kind of gets in his own way, basically. He's filed this additional writ, which kind of held up the process, and now he's complaining because the process wasn't complete. So we're just going to, I guess we'll just wait then on... I'm sorry? I guess we'll just wait to see what... Yeah, uh, he's but represented by attorney. We've made the, every every overture possible uh, to try to uh, get an answer. But I guess what I'm not <clears throat> hearing is an allegation of professional negligence or misconduct in all of this yeah. regarding the DNA analysis or any other forensic analysis. Uh, well, Let me just say there were two. I was going to just elaborate yeah. the testing results. Um, back in, this is when PSA was considered confirmatory testing for steam and now it's presumptive. So it was a, the um, samples, there was a PSA positive result, so it went for a differential extraction, which is why we had terminology of sperm fraction versus non-sperm fraction. But yeah, no sperm was detected. So I don't know, that might have been why he was talking about that, but we did, um, as Mr. Doyle said, we said we would retest it. Really, the most notable from the scientific um, part of this is that the lack of CPI that was reported for the mixture, but it was weird because, um, and this is back in 2001, the statistics were calculated and in the file, they just for some reason did not make it to the report. So that was important and we wanted to retest it, but we're standing by, we haven't received any evidence back. No, but that's the reason they haven't, because I'm still waiting to get yeah. word from the attorney on whether she wants, wants to proceed to that way. I will say, there was, his, prior to trial, um, he hired a, uh, uh, his attorney hired uh, or paid for a lab, independent lab, to do their testing. 
and he was uh, he was not excluded from that testing. So uh, he's had he's had multiple opportunities. But anyway, we're willing to do it. We're waiting to get word from his attorney on, and we'll submit the evidence to IFS to have it tested once I get the green light. Okay, thank you. So, in light of that, I would, I would make a motion to dismiss the complaint. Uh, it's pending for the DNA measure of interpretation of the DNA's office <coughs> to submit for retesting. Yeah, that's a motion. All right, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Which will bring us to our 13th matter. And this involves uh, James Smiley complaining against uh, Fort Public Safety Capital Area. Um, the complaint was kind of hard to understand, but essentially he was complaining against Austin PD, taking a DNA sample from him while he was in custody last year. Subsequently, uh, this subsequent certificate order for DNA swab. There was no order for the taking of the swab. Um, I'm not sure what jurisdiction we have over that answer zero. Uh, the evidence is still being in the investigative stage. The testing is not complete. Um, there's really no clear allegation of professional negligence or misconduct and certainly not within our just jurisdiction to address legal issues surrounding the acquisition of some sample. So uh, a lot of the staff's good work on covering all that. Uh, I respectfully make a motion to dismiss. Okay, motion to dismiss. Or second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And then that brings to our 14th matter, which is case number 19.53. Uh, John Jackson is complaining against the uh, Houston PD and the Houston Forensic Science Center uh, Forensic Biology Unit. Uh, he alleges some form of misconduct regarding a course of professional which we have no jurisdiction over. But also alleges very complaints against trial counsel, trial judge, which we have no jurisdiction over. And finally, he gets to the HF uh, Houston Forensic Science Center Forensic Biology section, uh, excluding him as a contributor in some serology results. Uh, he ended up entering a plea of guilty to aggravated kidnapping, uh, but he's now requesting comparison to evidentiary samples from another individual. We have no jurisdiction to do that. So while we have the complaint in front of us, uh, I fail to see any jurisdiction or authority by the Forensic Science Commission, so I respect the motion to dismiss that also. Second? Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And this brings us into our first complaint of the year 2020. Item 15 is 20.01, James Crowley against Houston DBS <coughs> Montgomery County uh, Sheriff's Office uh, and it really stemmed from his wife's allegation that DPS Houston had delayed a disclosure of some quality event in the lab uh, that occurred when they, there was examination done of a homemade gun holster uh, for genetic evidence and also a separate item of some blue uh, bag strap. Their complaint addressed recent changes in mixture interpretation. And they said the lab had halt, halted testing and reported no results in examination of homemade holster after the, the investigator's DNA was discovered on the evidence. He was not informed that quality event before trial. Uh, essentially, the staff had reviewed it and they effectively made a motion, made a recommendation we dismiss the case from very alleged professional negligence or misconduct with respect to the forensic analysis and by and large the complaint about the timeliness of disclosure of particular event is more of a red issue and certainly outside the scope of what our authority and our jurisdiction so I would actually concur with the recommendation. Any questions or comments? It's kind of hard to understand but I would expect to make a motion to dismiss. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Uh, motion carries. And ends. that would conclude our complaints and disclosures for today. Mm -hmm. That takes us to number four. I have a question. Oh, my name is Mike Martinez. I am the Trace Evidence Supervisor for the Bear County Criminal Investigation Laboratory. I apologize for my tardiness. I understand that this was uh, the self disclosure was. 
1943 was already discussed. I would like to have an opportunity to discuss further details that were not uh, given within the self-disclosure. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. Try not to take up too much of your time. I was made of the, uh, and I'd like to admit this after I'm done reading it to the commission as well as the licensing commission for review. Uh, I was made aware of the Bear County self disclosure on Wednesday, November 6, 2019, via an email by Warren uh, Dem, the lab director, which contained the uh, completed form. Still, as of January 2020, I have yet to speak with anyone in Bear County or in the crime laboratory regarding my involvement with this podcast. The nature of the podcast, or anyone uh, to explain to me exactly how I allegedly violated any Bear County policies, crime lab policies, or how this affected my licensure. To this day, I am not in violation of any Bear County policies, whether they be internal through the crime laboratory or through the county itself. Uh, here are important details regarding the podcast submitted from the complaint filed against me by the lab director, Warren Dim. On February 26, 2014, Meridian, in Meridian, Mississippi, a resident by the name of Christian Andrecchio, who was 21 years old, was reportedly found dead in his apartment, slumped over a bathtub with a gunshot wound to the head. Authorities alleged, allegedly conducted a 45-minute investigation and ruled it a suicide. Controversy has reportedly surrounded that ruling since. The Meridian, Mississippi Police Department closed the case as a suicide in 2014. There was no criminal or civil, civil case pending, and the DA has stated repeatedly that the case will, ruling will stand. On April 2019, I was contacted by a friend and private investigator, Sheila Wysoski, uh, to review the case and opine as, as it applies to the forensic sciences. This was nothing more than an exercise speculating on peculiarities surrounding the case for the explicit purpose of providing entertainment to our exclusive podcast subscribers and CrimeCon fans. And I don't know if you're familiar with CrimeCon. It's, a, 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 it's like Comic-Con, but for the aficionados, fans, for those that like uh, forensics and that one. Um, this episode was one of a popular series designed to have CrimeCon fans interact and submit their theories on real cases and ask questions to professionals. On October 2019, a very edited podcast of our discussion was released. November 6, 2019, I was unaware that the podcast promotion describing a description on Sheila Wazowski's Facebook page stated that I managed the trace evidence section for the Bear County Criminal Investigation Laboratory in San Antonio, Texas. This was uh, provided by the host, owner, editor by way of Google search and accurately represents my work experience. However, once I was made aware of this point of contention by Orrin Dim, I had the owner of the podcast immediately re remove the advertising flyer. The flyer was removed on November 6, 2019, the same day I was provided with the disclosure form. The standard disclaimer was applied. The opinions expressed on this podcast are solely my own and do not represent the views or opinions of my employer. I volunteer this information simply because uh, Orrin then noted it in the disclosure. So in other words, I did this on my own time at home and there was no affiliation or nothing was mentioned in the podcast that I work for Bear County. Incorrect discrepancies as filed by the uh, by, by Orrin on the Texas Forensic Science uh, Commission lab disclosure form. Okay, this was incorrect in the form that she received. At no time has there ever been an official examination, analysis, or report conducted or generated by me for this podcast. This is important. The interview was conducted on my own time and without any affiliation to Bear County. Second, is the forensic analysis associated with any law enforcement investigation, prosecution, or criminal lit litigation? This was incorrectly answered yes by Orrin. The correct answer is no. As I previously stated, this case has been ruled a suicide in 2014 by the Meridian Mississippi Police Department. No criminal litigation, investigation, or prosecution exists in Texas or in Mississippi. Lab director makes serious allegations that I have violated section 6. 51.219 Code of Professional Responsibilities, points 1, 6, 8, 9, and 12, which I'll address later. But first, I would like to say that I have, as I have made clear, this podcast was created for entertainment purposes 
from an adjudicated 2014 suicide in Mississippi. As per the Texas licensing requirements as stated in the Texas Forensic Science Commission website, and I quote, during the, the 84th legislative session, the Texas legislature passed SB 1287, which required all forensic analysts to be licensed beginning January 1st, 2019, the term forensic analyst means any person who, on behalf of a crime laboratory accredited under this article, technically reviews or performs a forensic analysis or draws conclusions from or interprets a forensic analysis for court or a crime laboratory. This clearly falls not within any of that. To reiterate, Bear County has absolutely no involvement nor will ever have any involvement with this closed case 2014 non-criminal suicide. Second, the podcast was conducted on my own time without any compensation for entertainment purposes, all within the confines of exercising my First Amendment rights <coughs> under U.S. Supreme Court Garcetti versus Cabellos. Additional readings involving this civil rights service protections on teachers are expressed, of course, with the lawyers in here. You're, you're well aware of the First Amendment uh, ruling of the Supreme Court. Third, I believe that all of the Code of Professional Responsibility points by the lab director alleges I violated are not applicable for the reasons stated in this, this uh, summary. Uh, it's a suicide. It's not criminal. The case has been closed since 2014. No pending civil or s criminal or civil uh, litigation is, is going to happen or ever happen. It happened in another state. No official report or analysis was ever conducted by me for court or crime laboratory purposes. It doesn't involve, nor will it ever involve, Bear County Crime Lab. I only provided speculative debt generalities that are well within my education and training and fall under my intellectual property protected by the First Amendment rights of the United States Constitution. It's a heavily edited podcast created for entertainment. The Code of Professional Responsibilities was written specifically for licensed forensic analysts who are employed in an accredited crime laboratory in Texas and whose official business is to conduct forensic science analysis, reports, and testimony on pending criminal litigation. Speculating on observation of a given historical event and applying general concepts of the forensic sciences for the purposes of entertainment or education is protected, again, under the First Amendment rights. There may be uh, some other motive as to why uh, the lab director has yet to still speak with me regarding this matter. I do not know. It is my opinion that the disclosure complaint should be denied and withdrawn as it does not satisfy the requirements for consideration this is a Bear County Crime Laboratory internal issue regarding the interpretation of employee expression and freedom of speech. In summation, having obtained a professional state license does not remove my First Amendment rights. Having a Texas Forensic Science Commission license is a spe is specific dis in a specific discipline does not discharge, dismiss, or require or relinquish uh, any years of, of, of gained experience not covered under the licensure, such as crime scene. <coughs> In other words, I have well within to give my expertise and opinions on crime scene, crime scene matters, as well as those that fall within my education uh, in forensic science. Having Texas uh, licensure does not allow ownership of one's intellectual property, as is the case with the, the bar, as with the case with the medical. Uh, one, a lawyer, is within their rights to give their opinion on case matters, especially when it comes to, let's say, Dr. DeMond gave a, a talk on uh, the John F. Kennedy uh, assassination. He's completely within his rights. He's just completely expressing his opinion based upon that. Uh, Lindbergh, I was asked to give talks, and there's been several talks on the Lindbergh. There's a lot of trace evidence that involved that. Again, it does not affect my licensure, and it's completely within my rights to express my opinions thereof. Licensure does not uh, inhibit opinions based upon statements or speculations of general forensic applications, new developments, or knowledge learned, especially when providing perspectives outside of the court of law. And this is important. Licensure is an individual accomplishment and does not interfere uh, direct ownership by the employer. I'm sorry, does not infer direct ownership by the, report, uh, the uh, employer. Again, I can go through the uh, individual points of the that was made against me at point one six eight nine and twelve uh and refute each and every one of those points but i don't want to take up too much of your time i think that this pretty much sums it all up and i would like to submit this as uh, an exhibit to the commission as well as to the uh, uh licensure well i might want to just say since you weren't here the commission chose to have no further action on the uh, complaint 
you were going to receive a letter, though, kind of talking about the what analysts are, are expected to do. You could certainly get a question about this in court. That's nothing the commission has anything to do with. Right, and I'm seeking legal matter, uh, legal counsel in this matter because, again, you know, it's a direct violation of my First Amendment rights, and, and it's unfortunate that it had to come to this level. But I thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak with you. All right, uh, number four. So if you recall, um, when this came to talk with us about um, sort of this universal quality standard that they want to work on with us with respect to exists in um, the supplemental standards, for example, for ANAB accreditation, uh, we sent Warren Merkel a number of things, uh, comments on the on the supplemental requirements for ANAB, our case summaries for um, various reports that we've issued over time, so he could see trends and um, and then the accreditation section of the root cause analysis for the APD DNA lab closure, so he could see a very clear example of a situation where the lab was accredited and assessed and audited many, many, many times. Um, and so we're, he's traveling now, but we should hear back from him next week. And I think what he's gonna provide is sort of an outline of the document that'll ultimately go through the SDO process. And so we'll put that in front of you before it goes anywhere. Okay, that's it. All right, next is the status of the Crime Laboratory Accreditation Program. Um, in your meeting materials, you all have a memorandum that summarizes all the accreditation communications that we've received, including cited nonconformances. They're listed in detail here. I won't go through them, but if anyone um, has questions about any of them, um, Lynn and I had a question just about one, and we asked for more information. And we kind of wanted to get the opinion of Dr. Kier on what, what do you thought the car and everything was sufficient related to the pipetting, the pipetting, the quality forensic toxicology, the yeah. EFT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This one I was. Um, I mean, we will repeat the materials. This one I wasn't really sure about. I'm not sure if there's someone from QFT here, but essentially this is um, this was a reaccreditation of quality forensic toxicology by A2LA, which was the accrediting body, not ANAB. And they were going through a reaccreditation and also a scope expansion because they were hoping to bring online their quantitative me method for the differentiation of hemp and marijuana. And essentially, in the documents, it shows that um, there is a non-conformance related to their pipettes um, that were determined to be out of tolerance as found during the calibration, and that was not addressed to determine the effect on analysis. But in the documents that were provided to the Commission, the root cause was identified as the requirement from A2LA, the accrediting body, was not understood. Um, so I think we probably need some more information. I think that's a cause, not a root cause. <coughs> so essentially, the documents say that the lab appeared not to understand the requirement regarding the fact that the pet pipettes had to be within tolerance. So I'm not sure that's really a root cause at all. So I think we may need to just request some more information from the lab so they have the opportunity to clarify that. Um, unless there's someone from QFT here that wants to address it. I don't think you have. Oh. You know what I found interesting about their car is that usually when you see a car and there's an additional writing on the car, it's initial. Like when there are, are notes added after the fact, you know who wrote, you know who added that, the writing in blue or whatever. And I'm wondering why. I mean, is it just assumed that everybody knows who wrote it, or I mean, typically you see like a initialing. So if someone 10 years down the road, they know who added the note. I agree. I think you could, um, none of us are documents them. Well, actually, we do have a document uh, examiner experience here, but 
you could you could assume from the document we have that that it is the person who signed it, T. Kirby on three twelve. But I agree completely. Basically, the car was modified after it was originally authored. Um, so rather than perhaps re-preparing the document, so it was a consolidated document that was finalized, signed, and dated. Um, I think you're making the point that those things could have been added after that, which would not be appropriate. Um, we're not alleging that. I think we need some more information, though. Um, the one thing um, that is clear in the in the in the car is that the lab did take um, corrective action to address it. Um, they incorporated additional verification um, procedures for um, within their standard operating procedures as a result of this non-conformance. So there's probably not a question that they've addressed the issue. I think that um, what's more disturbing perhaps is the fact that the lab misunderstood the requirement for the out of tolerance pipettes to be um, to be addressed. So it would probably um, be good for them to be able to address that on the record. So do pipettes end up out of tolerance very often? It's sort of a rare thing. Well, they can, and it's a requirement for the pipettes um, and other instruments that are used for those types of measurements to be um, calibrated, which is not the same as a verification, at least annually. So generally, for something like this, you would bring in a vendor that is accredited to ISO 17025 calibration standards to come in and actually physically calibrate those pipettes. But the labs will also internally verify those pipettes um, at, on regular intervals to ensure that, um, that they're operating within those specifications. Um, but this doesn't provide any detail as to how QFT did not understand the requirement for, as they described, the out of tolerance pipettes to be addressed. So. Okay, we can follow up with them and bring that information. I think that's all we need to do. Okay. All right, and on the next two, I don't think we have an update today because we didn't receive any responses to some of the questions that we had, uh, both for expert talks and uh, CAP. We followed up twice, so I'm not sure what else we might be able to do in this regard. Dr. Kerrigan, did you have anything you to add? Not really, because we need additional information. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, this was actually one of the issues in 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 that for for this laboratory also mm -hmm. there were there were two issues <coughs> we we sort of we asked the laboratory for sort of a matrix to show us because they had all these kinds of all these nonconformities like how did they resolve them and so on and so forth that we have not received and then with CAP, we asked a number of questions that are things that we know from the other accrediting bodies already about how they resolve, you know, retroactive case review and things like that, and we haven't received an answer. Now, the person we were communicating with was out for a period, so we'll try again. Mm -hmm. But if we don't get an answer, I would say by the next meeting, we're going to have to have a conversation about what that means. Or take a vote if they're not going to respond, then we can make a decision mm -hmm. by the lack of response. Right. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. And I would say well in advance of the next meeting. I think that given the fact that we've had yeah. this delay, yeah. they, like, 30 days is probably sufficient to get a response. Yes. Mm -hmm. And with the expert talks issue, I think the concerns were um, a much greater magnitude than just, for example, mm -hmm. pipette calibration, because I think one of the things the commission was more concerned about was the oversight and supervision of the examiners who were releasing reports um, that were, um, it appeared from the documents that were provided, the accrediting body allowed that issue to be resolved during the on-site inspection, which I think members of this commission found surprising um, without any kind of retroactive review of cases. There are certain things that the accrediting body will allow the lab to resolve on the spot. But that, mm -hmm. it, 
that typically they're of a more superficial nature than unqualified examiners. And as I recall, some of them weren't degree. Right. But yes. So that was a real concern. That's not an on-the-spot um, <coughs> rectification. Um, what about a letter to them saying that if we've heard no response by a specific date that this will be taken into account but at the next meeting and the decision will be made and then that way they're on notice that we will make a decision if they continue to choose to not respond. Yeah, the decision would be to remove them from the recognition as an accrediting body. Yeah. Well, well it would be removing <coughs> Yes. Yeah. Cap. Yes. Um, just to give you all some data on how this would affect, if we did remove CAP from our um, list of recognized accrediting bodies, there are only 11 total labs, and the majority of them perform toxicology analyses, and five of those labs are also accredited under SAMHSA, too. So there are really only a few laboratories that will be affected by this, and the majority of them are also out of state, but that's... I don't know if that's. Are there any other, other in-state labs that are only cap only? Um, Quest Diagnostics in Irving, but Quest we've had the conversation. They don't with perform. Them before, yeah, a lot of these. Uh, they don't. Laboratories don't perform testing within our jurisdiction. There are only a couple, and that question came up with expert talks. But we know of several instances, even in just the past year, where they either have accepted criminal casework, or we heard that they were considering accepting criminal cases. Not Kate. So with Quest, the analysis was under the statute. If the primary purpose of the testing is not criminal action, in other words, it's not forensic analysis as defined, but rather some other purpose, and it ends up mm -hmm. in a criminal case later on, that there's an exception for that. And the statute is mm -hmm. very clear. Mm -hmm. So with Quest, mostly they're doing employment testing mm -hmm. or other types mm -hmm. of civil or administrative proceedings. In transportation type cases. Right. And and then it may end up there. But they're so, you know, frankly, I'm not even sure they need to be on our list. We've had these mm -hmm. discussions mm -hmm. before. I think it's the, um, although it's disappointing that we haven't had a response from expert talks, I think it's more concerning that the accrediting body has not responded to this commission. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. the bigger question is, you know, we recognize these accrediting bodies. Mm -hmm. And if they're not going to even respond to requests, um, should, we, should they be recognized by the TFSC? Well, I think that's the whole issue. If they're not going to respond, right. then we need to make a decision and move on, and they can bear the consequences for not responding. Yeah. I mean, some of the things we asked them were very basic. We just asked them for their checklist that they use when they go out to do an on-site audit. We asked them to address why their certificates don't say that they're accrediting a forensic lab. They just give it the general you're accredited by CAP and give the end date of the accreditation. So there, it wasn't, we didn't ask them for anything that would be burdensome. No, and although it us. would be <laughs> unfortunate for the small number of labs that are only accredited by CAP to be affected by this, ultimately that responsibility falls on the accrediting mm -hmm. body themselves. So. And I'm not even sure that the effect would be, it's minimal. I, yeah. because I don't think most of those labs are actually required to be accredited under the statute mm -hmm. anyway. Um, it's just that they did it out of convenience originally when the law was first passed. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the 38.35 actually requires that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty clear. So what do you want from the Commission then? Do you think it's reasonable that if we don't have a response within 30 days, would you want the Commission to vote today that if we don't have a satisfactory response within 30 days from the AB to remove it so that we don't have to wait for another quarterly meeting to remove them? Or I, you would, I would prefer that we go through the full cycle. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go through the cycle. Well, one thing, we wouldn't be able to do a rulemaking and have you all vote. We don't have a rule today, so we'd have to wait till April. Yeah, yeah. we have to do this through administrative rulemaking and then we have to, <coughs> you know, that goes out yeah. for public notice and comments. The only other thing I would say with regard to expert talks is that I looked up their expiration date. They expire with CAP in July, and so maybe they're just not going to respond. And the they're going to let it lapse. I mean, expert talks doesn't have any license date. Yeah. But, so I'm not really sure how they're able to do it anymore. <coughs> just hope they never get called. <laughs> no, we'll just All
This is the licensing advisory committee update. Uh, Greg is here, so that's good. Do you want to talk about the licenses? Yeah, I'll just generated? give a quick update. We have 1,266 licensees now. Um, we finished renewing all of our blanket licenses, but we'll, we'll talk about the blanket rule today, but um, those licenses will expire this year in December 1231 because we only renewed them for one year. I think the proposed, our new proposal extends the term of the license to two years. Um, but whatever we do with the blanket license, we'll have to do it before 1231 when the current uh, licensees expire. And that's it for the licensees. Do you want me to go through the rules? To go through all the rules except mm -hmm. for the blanket I'll talk about. Okay. Um, the first one here, if you all remember, we voted to expand the exam eligibility to include unaccredited forensic disciplines. And so if you have any questions about what, the way we draft that language there and the disciplines we have listed, just uh, please let me know. Um, these are rules that we have not published yet, so there's still a chance uh, to edit these. Um, we also removed physical comparison, just the full term physical comparison from the materials trace categories of analysis, really just to avoid confusion regarding the application of that category of testing to document examination analysts that are performing uh, physical comparisons of paper in some instances. And so the issue was that do these folks now, even though they're exempt, have to get a materials trace license, which doesn't make sense for them at all. Um, because the trace requirements are just completely different than what we were, were previously required for documented analysts that are now actually exempt anyway. But we also, in the same rulemaking, we clarified the provisional fees and we just made it even with what anyone, what anybody that applies to get a license pays the same amount. Um, second rule here, we just clarified that you can only do the provisional one time. It's just something that wasn't clear in the rule. Um, let me do the last one as well, and then we'll go back to the blanket, because I think it'll be as quick. Um, and the final rule here, the fourth one, um, this rule exempts toxicology analysts who are transitioning to seize drugs that would other, otherwise need stats or specific coursework to add that to the scope of their license, as long as they um, got their license prior to January 1, 2019. Because it kind of would be unfair uh, to require the, the rules that are in place now when they never anticipated we're going to have to add this to the scope of their license. So sometimes people who are in blood alcohol or, or toxicology may add seized drugs and we just sort of were faced with a situation where it just made no <coughs> sense to require them to do heightened statistics when they already had their license. So it's a, a method of grandfathering that particular addition of the discipline. Um, the governor's office received and reviewed all of these and gave some comments um, and we've integrated those comments. Actually, the process of vetting rules through the governor's office has been very helpful because they're reading it as non-scientists and sort of, um, I mean, they obviously understand the work of the commission, but they don't do it day in and day out, so they point out to us things that may not be obvious. That, like, we sort of had this uh, habit of writing the rules to our to the stakeholders who understand what we're talking about, and they're sort of, I guess, encouraging us to be more disciplined and making sure that anyone who picks up the rules understands exactly what's happening and what we're doing. And so that has actually been a real benefit to vetting the rules through the governor's process. I think Lee would agree. Mm -hmm. um, you the chart. So we do need to take yeah. a vote on All right. these. Oh. So we'll do one, two, and four yes. before you go to three. Okay. All right, so uh, can I have a motion, or is there a motion, or any further discussion to accept as listed the rule addressing exam eligibility for unaccredited disciplines, the removal of physical comparison of the materials trace categories, and then the clarification of provisional fees. I'll make a motion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Is there a motion for the to accept the rule providing clarification for one-time provisional license? I'll make that motion. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
And then is there a motion for to accept the rule addressing exception from coursework requirements for toxicology analysts who applied for a license prior to January 1st, now adding seized drugs discipline to their license? I'll make that motion. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Seconded by the statistician, too. What? Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> Patrick will tell you he is not a statistician. I know. And they're not yeah. a scientist. So, <laughs> so, so let's take about a 10 to 15 minute break while they get queued up for the last part of this. That's <laughs> because we have to go
We have been working on the question of how, what is the appropriate level of oversight for laboratories who do not do a majority of Texas casework. These are mostly outsourcing laboratories who may take Texas casework from time to time or may have even a consistent load of Texas casework, but it is by far not most of what they do, and usually it's, uh, from what we've seen from the data, quite a small percentage of overall caseload. Um, we have about, it varies, but eight to ten labs that generally fall into the, the category of um, blanket licensure. They are in two disciplines, DNA and toxicology. That makes sense if you think about the fact that that's where the labs, the areas that labs typically need outsourcing assistance, and it also sort of follows the way federal grants work for backlog reduction and so forth. Um, what had happened, going way back to before the licensing rule took effect, there came a point at which we realized that we needed to do something. We had been very focused on creating a program for the analysts who do most of the Texas work, which are the laboratories physically located here. And toward the end, because Dr. Middleburg was on the LAC at the time, he was raising concerns about, you know, what are we going to do with people who are physically located elsewhere? We don't even know if they'll ever touch a Texas case because of the way we segment our work, because of our workflow. But the law does not distinguish between people located outside or inside the state. Um, so the rule that was adopted at the time was that we would have a blanket license and laboratories could apply for, these li for the blanket license um, in sort of batches of 10 for their analysts. Um, there were two different categories. One is if a Texas customer requests a type of forensic analysis that's not widely available in the other laboratory. So this is sort of a no-brainer. Sometimes, and we had a, a very recent example of this where TDCJ, lawyers for the Department of Corrections call, apparently sometimes um, inmates throw uh, feces and other things at the prison guards and um, they have some people who fall into the repeat offender category with respect to that type of activity and for those people who do that uh, over and over again they need a way to be able to um, test the material to prove up their case against that inmate and so they needed a particular type of testing that no, we asked and nobody does it. DPS doesn't do it, nobody else. And so um, we had a laboratory that did do it and so this would be sort of a unique or novel type of analysis. Um, the trickier category, so that's kind of a no-brainer. The trickier category is more like the labs that um, have a, a pretty segmented <coughs> workflow. They have a lot of analysts. And if they were to license each and every one of those analysts, um, it would be ex expensive and burdensome and so on. And we've heard these arguments and I've talked about it many times. Um, so the rule that was put into place was that if you had a laboratory that could demonstrate um, that their casework is needed to ensure the availability of timely forensic analyses. That's another issue, the timeliness. Um, in counties for which access to forensic analysis is limited, the lab's workflow is organized in such a way that either the temporary license criteria don't apply or um, <coughs> obtaining a license, or pardon me, and obtaining a license for the individuals who are doing the testing would be so burdensome as to restrict the laboratory's ability to offer forensic analysis in Texas. In other words, a business case for that laboratory would show that it, it is, it doesn't make sense to do business here. And that is not something that I think anyone wants to see happen because 
the outsourcing laboratories, the laboratories that take those cases, um, serve a very important function in Texas criminal justice. So um, at the time, the coverage was we had, like I said, 10 licenses per blanket, and the fee for those 10 was $100. They did not need to comply with specific education or coursework requirements. They didn't take the general exam. They did review the Texas Code of Professional Responsibility and complete the training materials relative to Brady versus Maryland, Giglio, the Michael Morton Act, and so forth. Um, the FSC staff was performing the criminal background checks for those and the term of that license was one year. So the term was actually different than the main license, which is a two-year term. So then, after we got the first class of licensees through, um, a working group of the commission started thinking about what the license should look like, what the oversight should look like long-term. And we sent a rule out for public comment that would change the existing blanket license um, to insist that blanket licensees would meet the same minimum education and specific coursework requirements as all other analysts, the license term would increase, would change to two years, the fee would change from $10 to $100 per analyst, the lab would certify compliance with proficiency testing to the extent required for accreditation, which is what all licensees do in any category, and the analyst would take a modified general exam with three modules Professional Responsibility, Evidence Handling, and Brady Michael Morton. Um, so then, that went out for public comment. We received extensive comments from NMS in particular. We also received extensive comments from Quality Forensic Toxicology, sort of on either side of the issue. NMS saying that the proposed changes uh, would go too far and would still uh, harm them and make it impractical for them to do casework in Texas. QFT, on the other hand, saying no, everyone, regardless of where they're located, should have to comply with the same um, licensing rules. And so at the December meeting, the Licensing Advisory Committee reviewed the public comment and engaged in a very lengthy discussion about what was in the public comment and how to address those comments in, in a collaborative way to the, to the extent possible. So, um, the rule, so the suggestion for a replacement for that rule, because uh, I think the consensus of the group was that some changes did need to be made to the rule, so it would have to go out for public comment again. The other rule would get pulled down and this would be replaced. Um, this would go in its place. So. The suggestion now on the table for your consideration, we have two documents that outline this in your materials. One is a table that sort of compares the original, the proposed that went out for public comment and now the new suggested route. Uh, so we have that in that table form and then we also have this outline that we passed out. The reason I printed this out was because just yesterday the LAC made additional recommendations that are reflected in here. Um, so to go over what it is that, that is being suggested is that number one, as a threshold matter, the distinction between what we used to call out-of-state and in-state <coughs> revenue be removed totally, completely. And in its place would be um, a de minimis casework threshold. So. What we're analyzing is um, whether the laboratory's overall caseload reaches this de minimis level, which after evaluating the data that we got from the laboratories, um, we thought the appropriate level to set would be 10%. And the reason we set a particular number is because we researched the use of de minimis thresholds both in Texas agencies, administrative agencies, and in federal agencies, and they always are very specific about the criteria in the rule. So that it's not just like it's de minimis that the commission thinks it is. Because that opens us up for allegations that the decision making is arbitrary. Um, so the way that 10% will be calculated if 
people agree is that um, the overall volume of casework will be looked at for the five calendar years preceding the application. It'll be calculated as a rolling average. If five years worth of data is not available, then we will use the best available data to either determine what the casework has been or in the case of a new laboratory, what it is projected to be based on contracts that they, I mean, as someone pointed out yesterday in the LAC, in order to get accredited, which is the first step for any laboratory, they have to have casework to um, be reviewed by the accrediting body to begin with. So they already have an idea of who their client base is going to be. Um, so we can use that information in the absence of historical data. Under this new proposal, um, the term for these licenses would change from a one-year to a two-year uh, licensing term. And the threshold determination about how the analysts in a laboratory that meets the de minimis threshold, how we decide who is licensed how, is by whether they meet the definition of what we're calling an interpreting analyst. And you can see that definition is set forth um, in the what I passed out here on page four, where it says full licensing of interpreting analysts. So those people, however named, and this is an important distinction because we're not basing it on what their laboratory title happens to say. What we're saying is, however named, an interpreting analyst uses his or her scientific expertise and judgment to interpret data resulting from an expert opinion, pardon me, expert examination or test, and provides information to the trier of fact either by signing a report or testifying in a criminal action. Interpreting analysts have significant decision-making authority regarding the <coughs> progress, evaluation, and conclusion of forensic analyses and are required to both perform independent casework and technically review the work of other analysts. An interpreting analyst exercises judgment in casework and may be called to testify regarding the results of forensic analysis, including not only the steps involved in the physical processing of the evidence, but also the potential <coughs> significance of information obtained from the examination or test. Technical reviewers who perform technical reviews of an interpreting analyst casework are considered interpreting analysts for the purpose of the licensing rules. So the idea is that in a laboratory that qualifies for de minimis status, which means they qualify for blanket licenses, any of their analysts who meet this definition will be fully licensed under the regular rules, um, just as any Texas normal normal. Any, any analyst who is doing work in Texas and one of the public or private labs whose majority casework is Texas casework. Those who do not meet the interpreting analyst definition will be subject to the blanket license requirement. And the blanket license requirements um, are listed under number five, page three of your uh, outline that I passed out. So for those people who do fall into the blanket because they're not interpreting analysts, what the laboratory will require to do is provide a list with the name of each individual, including the forensic disciplines for which they are qualified to do uh, independent casework, and then the laboratory will certify a number of things. Number one, Anyone who's licensed under the blanket provision works under the supervision of a fully licensed forensic analyst when performing work on Texas cases. So that's one thing. Number two, each person who's licensed under the blanket provision has read and acknowledged completion of Brady Michael Morton training material, the Code of Professional Responsibility, and evidence handling materials. Number three, anyone who is licensed under the blanket provision has participated in any of the ongoing CE trainings that we have with respect to Brady, Morton, and the Code of Professional Responsibility, we're putting those up every two years. These are free trainings and they are done online, so they don't have to fly anywhere to do it. Any failed proficiency, pardon me, proficiency test by someone who's licensed under the blanket provision that's not attributable to a mistake by the test provider, because that happens sometimes, those will be disclosed to the commission. Professional negligence or misconduct will obviously be disclosed to the commission. Will be copied on any material 
correspondence with the accrediting body. They're already required to do that, but it doesn't hurt to refresh their recollection that that's a requirement. Um, they are responsible for notifying us of any criminal conviction of a blanket licensee for an offense equivalent to a Class B misdemeanor above. The laboratory will pay a fee of $20 for each person on that list because it's a two-year period and not a, not a one-year period. And importantly, where the scope of a blanket licensee's work changes to include interpretation or to include work that falls under that provision, they will notify us immediately. In other words, they will have to make that transition right away, regardless of where they are in their term. They can't begin to do that type of work without being licensed. So, and that may include getting a provisional license for a period of a year until they fulfill the requirements, but still, they have to get move into the full licensure category because sometimes people progress in their career and they end up meeting that definition, though they may not have started that way right out of school. So that is, um, and then the final thing we wanted to say is that um, for forensic analysis not widely available, it stays the same. If you can demonstrate for us that you know, you're doing something like what uh, the lawyers at TDC were requesting in terms of analytical work, that's a separate category um, that the license will be granted, similar to how it always has been. So. This was this is the proposal that the LAC has come up with after reviewing the public comment in great detail, listening to the feedback from the laboratories. We also reached out to Bodhi, which we thought was important because Bodhi is a is a, a laboratory that does quite a bit of Texas um, casework. That's you know backlog cases. They do a lot of that sexual assault. And we know that's a huge priority for the state right now is to get those cases uh, processed. So, uh, and they asked some questions, provided some feedback. We really think that this takes into consideration all of the feedback we've received. And we're hopeful, um, I mean, I'll turn it over to Greg. You can tell them from the LAC's perspective how we landed on this and so on. Sure. Thank you. I'm Greg Hilbig, uh, License Advisory Committee. We received the feedback from the community, and thank you to the labs that responded. And we felt like there were some valid concerns, number one being the lack of fairness in just saying a geographical location. That, so we, that's how the de minimis came up, that if you're located in Austin, that 90% of your case works outside of Texas, you should be under the same rules as a lab in any other state. So that, that's how the minimus came from, just as a fairness issue. We really heard that and we had to agree with the in-state private labs that we needed to have a fair standard that wasn't just geography. And then we started looking at, we were never comfortable with analysts who had the blanket license doing the interpretive, going and testifying. And we, we felt like we could, with the method the labs were describing to us, where there were many hands involved in the case, it made sense to us, yes, trying to get all 10 people fully licensed. I can see where that's a burden. But that person that's actually taking final responsibility for the work, going and testifying as an expert, we were really uncomfortable with letting that person have anything other than a full license. So that, that's where we came with the two categories of fully licensed and uh, blanket licensed. And when we look at cases, I mean, just historically, in these two <coughs> disciplines in particular, the self-disclosures and complaints that we've seen that have created the greatest interest and concern at the commission typically involve some component of interpretation going wrong, whether it's interpretation of the data, whether it's what happens when you get on the stand in an adversarial setting, all of that stuff. Rarely is it the, the things that happen earlier in the process, and when it is what happens earlier in the process, that is typically identified under accreditation rules and disclosed to us separately anyway. So it, it's the interpretation piece of it that gave everybody great pause, and so that's why we ended up here. So I, I would agree with that, and the other component is you would know much better than me, but from my perspective, most complaints, most disclosures have to do with 
at least the serious ones, had to do with failing to recognize disclosure requirements, not understanding Michael Morton requirements, uh, at least the really the really significant issues. Relatively few come down to this guy didn't know how to fight that well, or they come down to ethical issues, things along those lines. So we wanted to make sure all the forensic scientists had that training, and that, that's really what's important to us. Nobody does, nobody does Texas case work and doesn't understand Michael Morton, doesn't understand Brady, because that's just, that's critical. So we got that for everybody, and then Lynn's very much correct that interpretation issues are key, so we want to make sure those folks are fully licensed. Is there any uh, further discussion or comments by anybody? Yeah, just a question, and probably should be like most of my questions. I guess. Um, why 10%? Where did that come from? Why not 5, 20, 17, 7 population based or some? Do we have a reason for 10%? So we looked at the data that we got from the labs, and most of them were right around 6 or 7%. Mm -hmm. And so we thought that 10% um, allowed for a little bit of increase say if they get one contract one big contract but it didn't allow that spike to sort of propel them into a situation where they have to get everybody licensed all of a sudden because of one contract you know that they get from hfsc for backlog reduction and when they're done with that they don't have barely anything for two more years and then they get you know it's it's sort of trying to take into account the, the data that we saw and the overall likelihood of them going above that. Mm -hmm. So it, it seemed to be a number that that everyone felt comfortable with. And that's also where the rolling average came from. Mm -hmm. if you got a one-time contract that brought you to 12%, but you were going to be doing it for six months. We didn't feel like that should push you into needing a full license for everybody. Mm -hmm. You want to clarify that maybe? I mean, no, I mean, in the language, if it's 10% and we go over 10 for a short time frame. So that's why we do a rolling average for the previous five years. Okay. That was, we yes. had quite a bit of discussion about how to handle that. Should it be three or five years? Should it be, and we ultimately decided that to avoid, how shall we say, any accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, pause. Well, just we don't want to incentivize people to delay casework or for clients. Casework. Yes. So until the following year, you know that sort of thing. Um, we don't want to provide uh, perverse incentives for people to do things at any particular time or wait or anything like that. With the three out of five issue, we could have you could conceivably, and this would be an extreme example, I wouldn't expect to see it, but you can conceivably have somebody do 90% Texas, 90% Texas, 90% Texas, 9%, 9%. So like, look, I didn't quite meet the criteria. They meet de minimis, even though over half their work over the five years was really from Texas, because they didn't get enough years. I think it looks like a really good compromise, and I just wanted to commend the Licensing Advisory Committee for their hard work adjudicating the public comments and coming up with this approach. It's, it looks good. Please. Yeah, they're massive. I think has a comment. Um, will the people who are falling under this, where they'll be changing to the, the new status, will they be grandfathered in for the uh, education and uh, requirements? Yes. Okay. That's clear. That will be absolutely clear in, in the rule. Thank you. Because there's we can't do it any other way because they relied on what we told them, yeah. applied for a certain type of license. And so they have a reliance interest. I, I forget the exact legal term, but something along those lines. But when they expire, then the new license, right. this will kick in. Well, or is that right mean? now, if they qualify under the new uh, definition, they'll transition into that license. Um, but what they won't have to do is fulfill our new heightened mm -hmm. coursework requirements. They will fulfill the requirements that existed when they originally got licensed. That's the, the distinction. Because if you recall, we added more, we added statistics, we added chemistry, we added, we upped the bar after January 1st of 2019. 
So in number 5B3, when you were talking, you said every two years they would have to do all the three modules. But as it's written, it just says the Brady Michael Morton update. So just you need to add the other two as well. Um, we'll make clear that it's Brady Morton and professional and responsibility. The, the mandatory, the, what we call the mandatory <laughs> legal training. The, the, same, the same three as in number two will be every two years. So, so evidence handling, we don't have a mandatory training for evidence handling every two years. Okay. The training that we have is about uh, Michael Morton, Brady Giglio, and for the Code of Professional Responsibility, which, thanks to Robert, we have, we're starting to develop a really, Robert and Steve, who's running our video right now, and our volunteers, we've developed what's going to be a really neat course where we go through each code section and give examples, Texas and not Texas cases, to show how these things play themselves out in real life. And Steve has a studio upstairs that we're going to use for recording, and we're really excited about that. So that's what they'll be doing every two years, and we just want everybody to watch that. But the evidence handling piece is not something that we do as a requirement every two years, primarily because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they get that in the lab, don't they? Evidence handling? Or not really? Yes? They should, they should right? Yes. Yeah. So, Greg? As far as evidence handling? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, most laboratories are well aware how they handle do evidence handling. Well, I think there's still confusion in the community about some of the legal requirements. So I think having a team that includes <laughs> attorneys for um, involved in creating that training had brings real value where the evidence handling component, I believe that people who with forensic backgrounds who may not have the legal background can provide that training pretty effectively. And one of the things, as we were approaching creating the training, we thought if we just put Texas cases under each of these examples, it's going to be really depressing for everybody who's watching it. So what Robert did was went and researched all these other cases and pulled findings from judges directly from decisions about um, how a laboratory or a prosecutor or whatever handled a forensic issue. And so we're using that to sort of juxtapose how Texas has handled these. And if you look at it consistently, almost throughout, you see a much more proactive approach from the Texas examples than you do from the other states. No offense to everybody else. I just want to add, uh, I'm not sure if it's any material. I suspect it is, but we saw a draft of the training yesterday. Even the draft form is superb training and I'm really excited about what what that team is what Robert's team is doing on putting that together. Robert's it, team of one. So I referred to as a team. Robert <laughs> Steve was, was it Steve? Uh, Steve is our videographer okay. who's but, so helping run this. Right? So what what yes. they've done is put together some really much needed training and I, I think the way they've done it is going to be engaging and I, I really like the fact that it's a lot of real world examples to drive home the point because you, you can hear I'll, I'll use Brady as an example because he's, he's my my Janet command you can hear Brady tell us how important it is all day but until you see real world examples it's not going to sink in for some people so mm -hmm. I, I really love the referring to actual cases that have happened it's, it's good to know Brady <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brady. Right we listen. <laughs> Is there uh, any further discussion? Do I have a motion to accept the uh, new blanket rule proposal? Second. 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 All those in favor? Uh, uh, opposed? Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Lee and Licensing? It's a video conference. Okay, so. Lee and I went to a conference that the uh, and Robert, pardon me, that the Attorney General's Office puts on every year for government lawyers, and they jam pack it with all kinds of great information for agencies. And one of them is about how to properly incorporate a procedure 
for video conferencing when we have meetings. And DIR gave a presentation about their sort of model rules for that, and so we went ahead and incorporated that into our policies and procedures. The bottom line is that we can have a meeting here with a quorum of commissioners and other people can participate via video as long as certain criteria are met, as long as we can hear them and see them and, uh, and, and that the feed that we're using or the technology that we're using meets certain DI requirements. It is also possible to have meetings that span three counties. So like we could have, except that Dr. Bernard has to be physically present because he's our chair. Whatever location it is that the public can go to. Um, the, so we could conceivably have a meeting that's like, you know, one location down around the Houston area, one in DFW and one here in <coughs> Austin. My fear, frankly, around actually moving forward with that provision is that the technology would fail us because there's also a rule that says that if if you lose quorum or it goes blank for a certain period of time, you have to end your meeting. So we have incorporated the DIR rules, but I think my strong preference would be to continue the way we've been doing it and certainly to always have a quorum of commissioners present in the place where Dr. Bernard is and in the place where the public announcement of the meeting is. Um, it's mean like Dr. Bernard is more important than the rest of us or something like that. Well, it's just the rules. It's okay. the law. It's what the legislature says. So we have to. You could make a motion that he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've got too much free time here. We need to move on. Yeah. I do have a question. Though. Yes. Is there a way to test this technology? I.e., like, if we have a quorum and then have one person, like a designated survivor, like, if I volunteer, said, okay, I'll stay in Brad's County for the Yeah, isn't that nice of you to volunteer? No, no, no. no. <laughs> it's like, it's like one person stay behind just to test it out. Yes, we can test it. And then if it goes, it goes out, then we know. Hey, yes. We can do this, but then that way we can kind of work out. Yes, things. and we could do that the next time someone truly can't make it here but could participate if they were given the opportunity <coughs> to use <coughs> Skype or go to I think we've done it with Bruce before. Mm -hmm. Bruce pre his before, pre before he was a commissioner. I know, I remember your face up there. It's a long time ago. <laughs> it doesn't count though. It? Yes. <laughs> so it's three counties, but they don't have to be contiguous. No, no, because then, no. They <coughs> so in, in our situation, based on where you all are physically located. It would be Houston area, <coughs> DFW area, and Austin area, most likely. Um, I mean, I guess we, we could do College Station too. I mean, well, not I'm all at the same time, but. You're in the Woodlands, is that right? Yeah. Should the Woodlands, Woodlands. Yeah. Woodlands. I mean, that's I'm just thinking. That's three. We could do it at, at my place. I could go there. I'm just thinking. Long term, but we need to try to test. Yeah, it out we need to. Out. We need to make sure because if if you and Dr. Bussini, Dr. Yeah. Kerrigan, and Dr. Downing are all in your office, and or you know, Dr. Bernard's here, and you and it stops working, or even if we lose the sound or something, we have to end the meeting. We have to we wait a certain period of time, but it's limited, and then we have to end the meeting if we can't done. get it back up and running. And so, since we only meet quarterly, that would delay everything we have to decide on. And so it puts us in a bit of a precarious spot if we. Well, we can vote to accept it, but not have to implement it unless right. somehow we have an emergency that right. requires it. Yeah, the options are there. <coughs> All right. So, um, any further discussion on that? All right, so anybody want to make a motion to accept the uh, policies and procedures allowing the incorporation of this? I'll make a motion to approve. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We will make it. Do you want to do number eight? Sure. Um, the first rule here in number eight. Um, copies exactly what our enabling statute and 30, uh, 
Texas Code of Criminal Procedure Article 3801, 3801 says we can do, and that is that we can refer investigative cases, cases that are accepted for an investigation, to the Office of Capital and Forensic Writs. And it, that's been part of our statute for a couple sessions now, but the Office of Capital and Forensic Writs hasn't <coughs> got any funding to hire anyone. Now they've got the funding, and so we need a process that describes how we go about referring those cases to them. And so we've had a number of meetings with um, Ben and his staff about how that procedure should go, and we've drafted a rule for you all because we think we have to put the public on notice about what that procedure is. And Ben Wolf is here. Do you want to introduce? I think you guys know Ben, but just as a uh, uh, Nice to be here. Nice to uh, meet all of you. Uh, Ben Wolf, I'm the director of the <coughs> Office of Capital and Forensic Rights. And so um, we opened up in 2010 and um, as the post-conviction public defender for capital cases. And then in 2015, our uh, mandate expanded to allow us to accept re referrals uh, from all of you, but not with uh, uh, any uh, commensurate increase in funding. And, uh, but in the last uh, session, the legislature gave us uh, um, the equivalent of uh, two attorneys to handle any, uh, any cases that are subject of uh, of investigation uh, from all of you, and we're eager to uh, start accepting these reports. And Ben's also our neighbor on our floor, too, so yes. him and his team are really <laughs> At nice the end of the other yeah. uh, long, dark hallway. We can just walk them <laughs> over there. <laughs> he has come to our rescue mm -hmm. on occasions when the construction gets so loud that we can't hear ourselves think, and he mm -hmm. brings noise canceling headphones. <laughs> um, Anyway, the bottom line is that we, we have, this rule has gone through the governor's vetting process as well, and we didn't have comments on it, so um, it, it would require a vote. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, so <clears throat> do we um, have a motion for uh, acceptance of the procedures for referral of cases to the Office of Capital and Forensic Writs? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? <coughs> All right, the second rule here under B is just a correction of a reference to the statutory definition of forensic analysis. And since in this section that's affected by this rule, we're referring to our investigative procedures, we think that we should be referencing the definition of forensic analysis as it applies to our investigative authority. And formally, this rule is referenced 3835, which is the admissibility rule for forensic analysis. And so we just corrected that reference. Yeah. We do. So does anybody want to make a motion uh, regarding uh, acceptance of the rule addressing the correction of the, the uh, definition of forensic analysis? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Update on the uh, complaint 1904 investigative panel. Yes, so if you recall, uh, last time we <coughs> received an update from uh, Dr. Vanessa Nelson from DPS because when we received the complaint from Dr. Collins, um, there was essentially an inconclusive result issued that um, should have been an exclusion as to Mr. Lee. And at the time, Dr. Badoli had made suggestions to the laboratory about identifying cases that fall within that inconclusive range, a certain likelihood ratio flagging those cases to identify, starting with DPS in Houston, whether Dr. Nelson observed any similar issues to what we saw in the Collins complaint in any of the other um, DPS casework in that inconclusive range. And so I think Dr. Nelson is here. And would you just let us know the results of the work you've done since the last time you were here. So since the last time, um, our initial query flagged 69 total cases from the Houston lab. 
um, and I've completed a review of all of those. Um, and so there were 30 that were identified where um, we want to now have the um, original reporting analyst take a look, um, and and they don't they just they don't know the results of my um, analysis. They just know that they need to look at the inconclusive comparisons on these 30, um, and then they're going to um, come back and and. You know, if, if they agree, then they agree, and if they disagree, we have a um, we have a, a process in our manual that we need to go through because then we'll have um, two conflicting opinions from technical experts, and so we'd we'd like to to go through that process. And then additionally, we ran the same query that identified the cases in the Houston lab throughout the state, and we're going to take a, a look at similar cases in other labs just to see. You know, is this um, unique to Houston Lab, or, or is it something that we have um, throughout our system? And then also as an aside, as of last week, uh, we stopped using the inconclusive range, so we're reporting the values of all likelihood ranges going forward. Um, and and I, I think that this complaint has shown us that you know we had a, we had a good intention with using that inconclusive range, but. But it had some unintended consequences. So moving forward, it's, it's probably better for us to just report the value. So that that started as of last week. And of the thirty cases, you said there were sixteen where you you didn't understand why the inconclusive was reached. I mean, basic like straight up, you know, why wasn't this an exclusion sort of question? Yes, so of, of those 30, so they fell into three different categories and, and 16 of those were where I, when I looked at it manually, I felt like um, they could have outright excluded the person. Um, and, and I will note too, if you look at the, the likelihood value um, for most of those cases, um, it falls in that um, supports exclusion category. So it's the software is working correctly. Um, it's just maybe we should have taken a little bit closer look at the electrofarogram to, to see if it, it uh, would have provided support for that exclusion. So, this, so the Starbucks result was technically inconclusive, but there's this little supports exclusion, leans toward exclusion yes. range, but right there around one, and these were those. Yes. And would the fact that it's in that little right around one range have been reflected anywhere in the case files of those cases when they were litigated? Yes. So the value has always been included in the case record. And so if if um, discovery process had occurred, then that value would be in there. And additionally, um, we've seen that in some of the trials, people were actually asked to read the value out loud in court and they were able to do so because that's always been included in our case record. It's just how it was reported, which the value was not included in the report. And that's one of the reason why we're, do, we're actually including it in the report now because it's more transparent because not everybody goes through the discovery process. Do you have a a timeline or an estimate of when, like, did you, have you told the examiners, look, you need to take a look at this and we need to know your thoughts on it by next day? Um, so the Houston lab, they were going to try to have it by the end of next month. Um, the issue is that there are a couple of those cases where it is voluminous, <laughs> the amount of profiles. So they wanted to give adequate time for them to be able to actually sit down and, and do this without rushing through it so yeah they've already they have um, the list of cases as of the second week of January and um, Andrew McWhorter had told me he had already assigned them out to people told them what they needed to do and so yeah we're tr targeting the end of February uh, I, mean, it is what it is. I think a couple things one is this inconclusive category wasn't really developed by DPS, it was developed by the developers who made the recommendation. And a lot of labs went in that direction. 
which wasn't a, I think, a good recommendation to start with. And so the consequences are what, what they are. Um, you have to remember, and this is probably the important thing, is that the software is a tool. And sometimes people use the tool as the deciding thing. It should always be reviewing. So some of these manuals, there are a lot of good scientific reasons or molecular biology reasons why something falls in that category that's clearly an exclusion because software only does what you tell it to do so you have to really be able to use both and so we're strong advocates of the analyst is the ultimate decision and they have to look at the data and see if it comports if it doesn't the analyst is the final decision if the software says inconclusive or even inclusion but it it is an interpreter of exclusion you should do so I think that would reduce this kind of issue. Yeah. So these were, some of these had, um, they had exclusionary alleles above the analytic threshold, but they didn't have the full profile, so they just excluded that allele. Is that? No. No, no most, so most of these are either um, profiles where there's very little information above analytical thresholds or it's a mixture where you have um, clear major and then you've got like just trace minor contributors and so um, if you're if you're looking manually um, you could sort out who the majors were and then you've got your leftover trace minor and so if you look at the leftover trace minor <coughs> and compare it um, and, and you're you're taking into account okay well this is in the stutter position so the software is going to model it different ways right but if you have an unambiguous allele that cannot be attributed to an artifact and it's in that trace minor then if you looked at the person they didn't have that yeah. to me that would be yeah. an exclusion okay. Um, so it's just, you know, for, they weren't maybe looking as closely as they should and they were relying on the value that came from the yeah. software. Well, one of the problems is that it's the nature of when you're doing something probabilistically. You're not saying this is absolute, so that's one of the issues. You have to understand that so that there will be a range of values. But in the mixtures, you have to determine how many contributors. And it can be ambiguous, and if you choose and you overestimate you can move that likelihood ratio up and you can move it from an exclusion to an inconclusive or something. If you underestimate, you tend to move it down towards exclusion. So getting it right or getting it underestimated is better than getting, getting it wrong and overestimating. So there are consequences that you have to decide. And so if you're aware of that, you can take that into consideration and that'll help probably a better affect your interpretation going forward. Right, because the overestimation allows for more ambiguity in the profile. So. I think, Gerald, you had your hand up. I was just wondering if the cases are any pending cases, the ones that you've analyzed, are they all? No, I believe that because how we did our query, we were looking for court activity, and I believe all of them have already gone <laughs> through the court. They've already been adjudicated. Okay, thank you. And they could be Harris County, but they could also be the other counties served by the right regional list. Could we get a list of the, the cases? Yeah, we're working uh, with OGC, our OGC on disclosures. And so yeah, we'll be able to. Okay. Can you talk now, Dr. Nelson, about what else? So at you're done, done with Houston in the sense that your piece is done, and then what else you did for the rest of the system? So the rest of the system, um, we've just gotten to the point where we ran the query, um, and I I need to filter through the query because sometimes the query produces duplicates, uh, duplicate cases. But I think it's around 120 something cases throughout the rest of the state, and so I've contacted so far the three labs that had the least amount of cases because I figured that's low hanging fruit. I can get to those. Um, we're, we're getting them, um, if they're not already imaged in our system, getting them imaged in our system so that I can access them uh, remotely. And then I'm going to complete the review, and I may get assistance also so that I can do it faster than I did the Houston ones. Uh, but I'm going to complete review. Um, and then if there's any differences, again, I would like to send them back to the original reporting analyst because this is also a way to test our 
you know, our change in policy moving forward as well to see if that's, you know, robust and, and it's going to prevent this from happening uh, in the future. Okay. So we will have then more information, I guess, maybe beginning to mid-March because the Houston folks are supposed to finish by the end of February, so you'll have information at yeah. that point. And and if I don't, if we don't have them all, at least we can get, you know, the ones that are done a spot check of, of where we're at, and and then the results thus far. Okay. Because I, I know for a fact that there are two. One of them took me, you know, three weeks to go through. It's that voluminous. So those two are going to take some time. Okay. And that's one good point. You know, out of these 16 cases, there are multiple profiles in every case. Yes. And some of these um, profiles that now we're looking at may not necessarily be the totality of the evidence in the case. So we'll be able to give you all that information. And I, I would echo that. I mean, it's not like it's one case and everything in that case is bad. It's like hit and miss here and there. It's like, oh, these all look good. Oh, there's one that maybe not. But there was 15 profiles in that case. And 14 of them were fine. Well, that's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Update regarding crime scene investigation working group. So we're going to be meeting again on April the 7th. And at that meeting, we will be going over an outline for the licensure program for crime scene reconstruction. Um, so after today, Robert and I will start working on that, distribute it to the group, and then I'm sure there will be a lengthy, thorough discussion of how that looks, what revisions should be made, and so on, uh, when we meet on the stuff. Okay. Next is the uh, work groups, developing right. work groups. So, if you recall at the last meeting, we adopted um, a recommendation for voluntary adoption of the standards that were on the OSAC registry at that time. Um, and these that Lee has listed here on the agenda have been added from that meeting until now. There's one talk standard, uh, best practice recommendation guidelines for opinions and testimony in forensic toxicology. And then there are two what we call interdisciplinary standards, 21043, it's an ISO standard, and then 29. 17-19A, which is sort of general training, continuing education, professional development. So if you recall at the last meeting, we had said we were going to start by recommending adoption to the extent applicable of um, what was existing on the registry at that time. Then these three were added, and we had said that we were going to have, uh, in partnership with the TACLID, groups of SMEs that look at them and make a recommendation to the Commission about whether we can add these to the existing list or whether there are issues with them or whatever. So basically, uh, Peter Stout, who's here today, has been thinking through, you know, who can do that for each of these standards. And so, uh, did you want to mention anything about that, Peter? Yeah, I've got a list of folks going for toxicology. I think I've got... We'll talk about DPS about a name from DPS. What I've been looking to do is people that aren't currently on the NOSAC or recently on the NOSAC to try and spread the opinions around some, but then also geographically distributed across the state, try to get some distribution of various types of laboratories and, and sizes of laboratories to be part of the group to look at these. Um, and folks in talk on toxicology first. So I've got a couple of uh, postmortem folks, a couple of uh, regional, various size public laboratories. Was just talking with commercial laboratory about somebody from commercial and somebody from kind of consulting. And, and I think I should have a group together to look at those talks once here shortly. Because that was what you and I talked about the first group to try and get in place. And then we can circle around about the more general one next. The more general ones, I think. Um, we can handle the vetting of those. Um, I think we'll probably ask the crime scene group to take a look at 21043-2. And then on 2917-19A, Peter, we can put our heads together about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect the toxicology ones that exist right now to be much of an issue. No. However, I will caution, there are some that are in the pipeline that will be more contentious. Right. And 
about one more discussion. I think this talk standard, I sort of, because DPS does have the case work for the state, you know, I'll often ask them, can you just take a look and, and let me know from your perspective if there are any issues. And they did that and said that it looks fine to them. That doesn't mean necessarily that DPS, if they have no issues, that nobody else will. But I think Peter's right in saying that this particular one is, is probably not going to be an issue. It's some of the ones that are coming down later. There are a couple of things I want to add there. I would I would agree. I think that um, regardless of whether or not we recognize them or not, I, I recommend that, we, that certainly we do, they're already being used in the courts in Texas. Um, and that toxicology one, NCASB 037, has been used in. This was only put on the registry in November 2019, and that's been used the last four times I testified. So whether or not we recognize them, they're already being used, and that's a good thing mm -hmm. in the case of that particular standard, because there's some language in that standard that's there to really rein in on the wheel of the opinions. Um, so that's that's really good. I think that what we need to do is make sure that when we ask CAPCLED to establish these groups to review them, <coughs> We're clear that we're not asking them to go back and redo the work of the OSAC or the SDO and evaluate the technical merit. What we're asked, because it's already been through a consensus-based um, standards development process, I think this commission is interested in knowing what the impact is going to be to the labs so that we can identify um, anything that we need to do to help them meet the standard. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the scope. Um, yeah, I'm not asking for them to necessarily <coughs> provide, assess the technical merit, as it's already been through that, but to focus more on um, some of those other issues, or identify, if there are flagrant issues, to notify the Commission, but I think it's mostly going to be the impact of the standards. So I, I, I understand. Dan, that that's certainly one component, but I know like in DNA in particular, there may be some that are things that came straight over from Swig down that Bruce in particular may say like, what about this and what about that and why'd you write that and this, you know, there may be actual technical issues, technical issues in those. Right, so I think that should be, that should be part of the review, but we don't want these tackled task groups as they become developed to perform a review of technical merit on every standard unless it's really necessary. Clearly there are going to be some it sounds sounds like for which that's that is going to be um, part of the review. But you know I think we're concerned about and these are these standards will be voluntarily adopted by the labs themselves, but we don't want to create a situation where we um, are requiring the standard, and we're not requiring it because it is voluntary, that actually impedes criminal justice um, process in, you know, the effort is to enhance and gradually improve the standard and practice of, of the field. Um, we don't want to make it impossible for labs to get the work done. Um, but I think it needs to be, it needs to be principally focused on the resource needs rather than technical merit. I wouldn't necessarily agree. I do think that merit is an important issue. And as I said in the DNA, I've seen some that say, I don't know why they're even making the recommendation. Example would be if the range of the testing that was done by developmental validation, which means some manufacturer did it, no internal validation can go beyond that range of testing to determine the limitations. That doesn't make a lot of sense because we do that all the time. If you have a tool and you can do the validation testing to demonstrate it works, that's the whole process. That would limit growth, flexibility, able to, to move forward unless the manufacturer goes back and does it again to do the same test that the lab would do internally. It sort of boggles the mind that someone even offer that, but that's in one of the recommendations. So I'd say lock, stock, and barrel and looking just at a resource would be troubling in that. And it may not be in the ones you're working on. You, you may be addressing that yourself. The ones particularly of uh, Swigdam, Lock, Stock, and Barrel, uh, you know, acceptance, 
Sweet Hand doesn't necessarily represent a large group of people, it's a very limited group, and it may not get the feedback that's necessary. So I think we should be cautious about just accepting that review. So I, I, I agree that there are clearly going to be some disciplines for which there, there needs to be more of a technical review. This is even more of a reason that labs and individuals should be fully engaged in this process when these documents go out for um, public comment, for which there are many opportunities. And one of the things that we've recently changed in the process is that um, the, the draft documents that are the OSAC documents themselves are now on the subcommittee website, so they can be re reviewed before they're even sent to the SDO, and we're actually changing the way those appear on the subcommittee websites to make them a little bit more uniform in, in the way that they look. So again, I really encourage the operational labs to look at those, provide comment to the OSAC, but also engage in the process of the SDO, because if we can address those before they go through the SDO... I would agree with you, however, in this case there was comment on it and it was just dismissed by the group. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and I don't think we should adopt things if there's a good, compelling argument why it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, we've seen, uh, just to be honest, through the process of being on the Legal Resource Committee, there are comments that I, that the LRC made, or the statistics group made, or human factors made, and they were just dismissed. And some of them were really good comments that I think were unfairly or inappropriately, frankly, dismissed because whoever the core group just didn't think it was important or thought that it was addressed and it, it wasn't. So we definitely saw from, just from the perspective of someone who sat in a group that often had their comments dismissed or, <laughs> you know, um, I sort of get what Bruce is saying. Now, some of those I would never come back and, and try to say that this commission should change the standard to make it X, Y, or Z, but I mean, there have been comments that the statisticians, the lawyers, the human factors people are all in complete consensus on it. For some reason, we just couldn't get that communication through to make a change, and we tried, you know? And I think, I, I agree, I think you're right. I think you'll see big differences between the disciplines, however, because mm -hmm. there are some disciplines and subcommittees that have been far more successful than others at having more open dialogue. And I also think that, to your point, it's one of the reasons why, in under the new structure of OSAC, those resource committee members are being embedded into the subcommittees directly, um, which will, will further improve that process. Anyway, that's the end of my FSSB. Uh, I'm saying, I, I think it's a good effort. I just think we should always be reviewing to see what's best interest to promote quality science in Texas. And we've seen inconclusive categories come up that make sense at the moment. If someone does it, come back to bite you, and if we can try to look at those. And some of these committees do have their own culture dynamic to, to push what they want, not necessarily what the community wants. And we can at least be a filter to ensure it meets our needs before. We just wholesale it off. I think one of the things with regard to focusing on the resources, I, my point was that some of the standards that are coming down are going to um, potentially dramatically change the scope of the work or the work product that's expected. And I think that this um, body can play a role highlighting the fact that labs are going to need additional resources to expand that scope. It's all well and good to say, yes, this is a good standard. We would love for you to expand your scope and sensitivity for everything from medical legal death investigation to drug facilitated crimes or sexual assault and DUID, but the labs are going to need help to achieve those standards. So I think we're really going to ask the labs to tell us what they will need to meet the standards. So for me, that's probably one of the top priorities mm -hmm. and um, address the technical issues as well. And I think, Peter, when you bring the groups together, and we'll start with talks, because I think Dr. Kerrigan is foreshadowing what the issues are going to be. Oh, yeah, that, we all see one right. that's coming down that we're all scratching our head about. So that in that particular discipline, uh, but whoever we bring together, I think we need to 
ask them to please be willing or let them know that when we're asking them to participate, we mean not just this one, but it's going to be this one plus the ones that are on the subcommittee list so that if they're up there and there's still an opportunity to comment, we could even put in a, a unified, like, Yep. Texas okay. laboratory comment, which may or may not carry any more weight than anything else <laughs> that we do, but we can try. You know, we can try to say, like, look, this comment reflects the opinions of 50 labs in a very large state. You know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, yeah, it'd be great. I mean, I know right now we're trying to catch up because there are a few things on the registry that we want to vet. But to me, like where we can really influence is where Dr. Kerrigan says those subcommittee documents, like get on them yep. early. And yeah. And, comment. and so yeah, the folks I've been talking with, that's, that's kind of the framework I've been telling them is, this isn't really formal just yet, like this is a two year appointment to this working group or that kind of thing. We still need to kind of see how this evolves. But this isn't just looking at these OSEC standards that are right now. There's more complex stuff that we need to start looking at, um, and trying to have a group that is looking at this. As Sarah says, what is the impact of us? It's part of the reason we're trying to get a, the breadth of representation um, and perspectives in there. But then also, they've they've already started replying back of thinking about stuff that's with the standards board and after public comment and thinking. They've already started thinking this could be a good, a good, good pivot point for, for public comment that's a more unified public comment. Okay. You know, has TACLIT actually sent in any responses as a group to any of the standards? No. Something that's not something that's a good idea, but yeah. They need to. Because, yeah. of course, everybody is, every, every individual um, can provide mm -hmm. their public comment, but I think. Um, if there are standards that have gone through the process, um, if you have a consensus opinion from TACLA, um you should I, exercise the other. Yeah, yeah I, I will say, I think over the last couple of years, TACLA's kind of coalesced into something that's a little more, and we still, need, we still have support to do on that, a little more organized, a little bit more participatory. Um, I think it's improving and continuing to encourage that among all the laboratories. Uh, participants. <laughs> but it's a way that the group could have more yeah. impact on the front end yep. rather than on the back end. Right. All right. Uh, next is an update on the statewide validation yes. for marijuana. <coughs> Okay, so um, the hemp marijuana um, differentiation group um, met at some length yesterday. And for those of you that are not familiar, basically this was an um, initiative of the commission with the assistance of Sam Houston State University to help the operational labs in Texas resolve the issue um, that exists with the differentiation of hemp and marijuana. So this is just sort of an update on what the group has achieved um, since the last meeting. Basically, um, TACLID identified some core partners. Um, those included the Houston Forensic Science Center, James Miller, who is here, um, Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences, Kay McLean, um, Texas DPS Lab Services Chance, who is actually representing uh, three of the participating DPS labs um, in this intra-lab validation. And then Jessica Cheng, who's a doctoral student at Sam Houston State, has been working lots of late nights in the lab on this project and, and myself. So uh, basically the analytical approach that we've taken is based on the, um, the DEA approach. Uh, it's a modification of that. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, essentially that is a qualitative test. So it doesn't require the lab to change their scope of accreditation. However, it uses a decision point control to identify a specific threshold, and most of the labs are using a 1% threshold. Um, 
to identify samples above that threshold for reporting purposes. And the decision point is administratively set, so even though the federal limit is 0.3% by weight, um, many of the labs that are using it have established their own limits, most commonly 1%, others have chosen 2%. And essentially, uh, samples within uh, a batch that are above that threshold are reported out as um, uh, positive or containing marijuana, and plant extracts that fall below that threshold are reported as negative. So it still is truly a qualitative test just with this decision point um, control. And that's an approach that's been widely used in the other disciplines for many decades. Um, there are a few things that we did differently from um, DEA, and so I wanted to just kind of provide a brief update on, on some of those. Um, with Peter's help, there was they surveyed the labs throughout Texas to determine what was the most common GC column that was being used. So we developed our method using a different column from DBS, but it was the most universally used column uh, throughout the operational labs here. We also um, did a lot of extensive method development and optimization. We're using a different extraction solvent. We also selected a different internal standard. We're using peak area ratio instead of peak height ratio, which was used by the DEA. And so we're looking at the difference in the area counts between the Delta 9 THC <laughs> and the deuterated analog. Um, we also spent some time um, optimizing the uh, chromatographic separation of the cannabinoids. And we ended up coming up with two methods. Um, perfect separation of all of the compounds we wanted to uh, separate was achieved in 12 minutes, which we were pretty proud of, but for production labs they wanted a faster method. So we have two approaches. There's a short method which is less than six minutes and a long method which is about 12 minutes. And um, all of the work that's been done up until this point is exclusively on plant materials. So this is not, these are not the liquids, but that is the next step. Um, some other things that were different in our approach from the other labs that are using this general scheme is that we're using something called dual SIM scan acquisition. Um, so what that means is that the GCMS instrument that is um, uh, uh, used for the analysis is capable of switching between those two modes of acquisition. And the SIM is selected on monitoring and that's the, the channels effectively that we're using for the decision point reporting. So is it positive or is it negative? And full scan um, is, is used throughout forensic chemistry, drug chemistry, very, a lot more familiar with that, and that is used for the qualitative identification. So the method that we're using has the ability um, to benefit from both of those approaches. So that's working fairly well. Um, we also evaluated multiple internal standards. Um, four in total, we looked at um, the internal standard that was being used by the DEA and other labs, we also evaluated, um, so that was androstein Dion. we also looked at trivenzylamine, um, phenanthrene, and ultimately the deuterated um, analog as well. Um, we're running decision point controls throughout our batch, um, and at our meeting yesterday, um, the group made a decision that we're going to be using the highest of those peak area ratios for all of the controls throughout the batch um, for, re for reporting or decision point um, purposes. So that gives the benefit of the doubt to the defendant. Um, and this is an interlab validation. There are seven sites. Um, as I mentioned, Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences, um, Houston Forensic Science Center. Uh, there are four sites at DPS and Sam Houston State University. Um, and we are looking at plant materials and we have secured um, authentic known compositional plant sub substrate from the NIDA drug supply program. Um, they actually arrived uh, yesterday um, at the university. So while I was on the plane, they were arriving and we began that process in July. So it's been really lengthy. So I know everyone's really relieved that we finally have have these samples for the study. And we've also decided to supplement the NIDA plant materials with some additional um, plant substrate from commercial sources that will allow us to look at more samples that are actually below the threshold. So that's just another way for us to make our 
um, interlab validation even more robust. So this is kind of a quick view of our extraction schematic and I noticed that the, the color here has been changed. These were little green globules representing marijuana. They've been changed to uh, something red as a toxicologist looks more like a red blood cell than a burner <coughs> looks like, but that was unintentional. So here we have, we basically put our 50 milligrams of plant matrix in our tube. We extract with uh, five mils of methanol. Um, that is the equivalent of a 0.1 mg per mil solution. Um, we filter that, uh, uh, remove the particulate, add um, deuterated analog, and it goes on for GCMS. So, and this is very similar, that is almost identical to the uh, DEA <coughs> procedure with the exception of the solvent that we're using. Um, and the fact that they have actually the internal solvent in the extraction solvent and in our um, uh, method development and optimization we've taken that out and are adding the deuterated um, prior to analysis. So this is what some of the data looks like. Here's an example of the control at the 1% with the deuterated signal and the non-deuterated signal here uh, using selected ion monitoring. And although um, some of the drug chemistry labs are currently using SIM for analysis, for example, um, Harry <coughs> Kent Institute of Forensic Sciences has been using SIM for some time, but not all of the labs have been. Um, but that's been used in toxicology for decades. In fact, we've sort of evolved from doing GCMS SIM to doing more LCMS-based methods using multiple reaction monitoring, but it's the same kind of approach. Um, so there's nothing new about what we're doing here. It's widely accepted by the courts. And we're using retention times and ion ratios to make the identification. And that's really for the decision point. So that's the, uh, the cutoff calibrator at 1%. Um, we're also using the full scan acquisition component of our analysis for supplemental identification. So what you can see here is the separation of a lot of our common cannabinoids. This is actually from our, our short run, our Delta 9 right here, that's that peak. Um, this is important because if the examiner has a plant matrix that has been, that contains another substance, they can use the full scan acquisition to identify it. So for example, in Houston, they see quite a bit of PCP, so this method can also be used for their qualitative identification and they can do library searching and all of the routine stuff that drug chemists are used to using um, routinely for qualitative identification. So that's very familiar for them. Um, these are probably not of interest to the commissioners, but uh, might be of interest to the folks that are wanting to replicate the method that we're using. So those are some of the instrumental parameters for uh, the short and the longer run that we've been using. What's, what's the difference in the, in the, difference in the outcome it's just that with the longer run we can separate more of the less common cannabinoids mm -hmm. so, so yeah so um, really the differences are in the temperature programming for the separation itself so um, in the in the, the short run we separate all of the common cannabinoids that we see in plant matrix if there should be any kind of coelution uh, the examiner then has the option to reshoot that sample on the longer run, which is also validated. Um, but it improves the efficiency of the analysis, but also gives them the option to separate some of the less common substances. And um, in truth, you know, many of the substances that we included in the long run um, in the selectivity mix are not substances that are encountered in plant matrix. But because we intend to use this for our liquids, um, afterwards, we just decided we were going to address that that now. So we have very good separation here. Um, so sort of in summary, uh, method development and optimization is complete thanks to the incredible hard work of um, James, Kay, Chance and Jessica. Um, the technical procedure has essentially been finalized, so we're not planning to make any changes with any of the technical steps in the procedure but we are making additional recommendations for best practices and procedural changes in the SOP. So we're not quite ready to send that out to the TACLID yet because as we go through the validation uh, process, we are um, beefing up some of the uh, QA aspects of that. The validation is in progress. Um, we're continuing to enhance the validation scope. Um, and I was very proud that yesterday um, without even too much convincing on my part, 
um, the team agreed to incorporate measurement uncertainty into our validation, even though this is a qualitative test, so uh, well done. And we're going to do our measurement uncertainty at point three, which again is far below the administrative cutoff that is going to be used in the courts. But I think that's a good indication of how progressive um, this group has been. So, um, so this is a multi-site uh, study. Uh, it's an interlab validation. Because of that, um, it's inherently more complicated getting this done. Um, and so Houston Forensic Science Center, um, HCIFS, and DPS have done a fantastic job of putting up with um, short notice meetings and webinars that we have when we're literally all sharing data at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, and then we'll have a webinar the next morning. That's how um, fast-paced this project has been. Um, but certainly because it is an inter-lab validation, it's more complicated than an individual lab just developing a method and validating it and putting it online. So it's more complicated, more time consuming, but ultimately it's more robust and I think it will increase its utility for any operational labs in Texas that want to replicate our method and, and try to use it. Clearly they will still have to go through their own validation on site, but this will certainly make that easier for them. Um, so Sam Houston, originally I think we just volunteered to distribute the plant materials, but somehow we got sucked in a little bit more. Um, so we've really played a supportive role in development, optimization, and coordinating the collaboration. And um, I just want to thank our administration at Sam Houston State for allowing um, me the opportunity to do that, because without having a supportive dean of the College of Criminal Justice and a provost that is willing to allow us to use our time and resources to do something that is as time consuming as this, it wouldn't be possible. Um, TACLED has done a really good job on the front end, kind of coordinating the group, identifying the people who are going to be part of that group, and on the back end, we'll be um, dealing with all of the dissemination to the lab. So once we have finished our validation and have a, a, an SOP to share, we're going to, rather than those requests coming to myself, or to Chance at DPS, or Kay or James. We're going to send all of that to Peter, and Peter is going to disseminate that out uh, via the TAC lab. Just to make the process more efficient, I already have 709 unread emails. I don't need any more, thank you. And something I haven't talked to Peter about, but um, I'll mention here, is that um, because the we ordered sufficient plant material from NIDA, uh, for this study for the operational labs in Texas to, to use in their own validations. And they have just arrived, which is great, but I'm going to ask the labs that are requesting it just to hold off until Peter and I can communicate on that because um, my first priority is to get the plant material that was shipped yesterday to Kay, James, and Chance this next week so that we can continue the hard work with the validation. Um, the very next step is to come up with a system so that the labs that are requesting it can go through TACLID and that PETA can give me that information so that, again, I'm not inundated with people who are trying to email me making those requests. So the good news is we have the materials for the labs to use. It can obviously to validate the method that we're or for their own purposes to validate the methods that they've developed in-house. Um, there should be enough for them to, if they're using a 50 milligram quantity, just to kind of give you an idea, which is what the DA is using, um, each lab that, that makes a request to us will have enough for 100 tests, which I think is more than sufficient for their in-house validation. So they'll have at least 10 different plant matrices and they'll have enough for 10 um, uh, identifications. But I would warn them that those are very precious samples. Those should not be used for training. They should be used for their, their, their validation. It's up to them how they use them. But basically, um, Peter gave us some numbers at the beginning on how many labs that he expected to make the request, which was about 20. So we've budgeted for 30. So there's some buffer there, but um, um, they should the, the quantities will be limited so that every lab has the opportunity to benefit from these, these samples from NIDA. And although it's been a lengthy process dealing with them, um, 
we really appreciate your help. Uh, we really couldn't do a study like this without that. Um, so the data is going to be submitted for publication in a peer review journal, not just for validation, that was one thing, but I think during the course of the development and optimization, we discovered some things that haven't been documented or reported elsewhere, and as other labs are developing those procedures, we really want to make the broader scientific community aware of some of the limitations of some of the internal standards. So it's very important that we get that out. Um, and um, many of the labs, several of the labs have already been using this approach. It's, there's nothing new about what we're doing. Our SOP is unique. I don't believe there's an SOP like it, but the approach has been used with success by other labs. So we haven't invented anything. Um, uh, Barry Logan showed me a news article yesterday that said that Sam Houston had invented a new machine to do this analysis. <laughs> that is not what Sam Houston State has done. Um, we just machine. have to optimize things um, and we'll, we'll further help with validation. But um, I just give tremendous credit to DPS and Harris County and the Institute for their hard work with this. Um, so the approach is not new. Um, DA has been using this for a while. Uh, the state of Virginia has also been using this with actually a 2% threshold and National Medical Services NMS has been using it as well with success. Um, decision point calibrators are not new. We've been using them routinely for toxicological screening for common drugs of abuse for decades in talks. Um, and the approach that we're using, again, is not new. With SIM acquisition, with full scan acquisition by mass spec, has widespread acceptance by the courts and is, has widespread acceptance by the accrediting bodies, which is uh, very um, important as well. So um, as much as I would like to take credit for some new machine that we've developed uh, that can do this, it's not the case. Um, I also wanted to recognize the DEA, um, Sandra Rodriguez, um, and um, so Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Scott Alton um, at the Special Testing Lab in Dallas, Virginia, because really they shared their method, they shared their validation, um, they were the first ones to do this. Um, also, Virginia Division of Forensic Sciences, Dr. Linda Jackson, who's a lab director, and Dr. Becky Wagner, who uh, was involved in the development and validation of their method, and we've shared data with them just um, as they shared information with us. So again, we really appreciate their help, and also, uh, last but not least, the NIDA Drug Supply Program um, for providing those authentic samples. So right now, the Department of Forensic Sciences at Sam Houston State University smells very aromatic, thanks to, <laughs> um, thanks to the, the large shipment of marijuana. And, <laughs> Well, that is the time to have a uh, small uh, Cheetos and uh, Fritos <laughs> right, uh, yeah. commissary right around there. And although it was not by design that I was actually on the plane at the time the stuff was delivered by FedEx, and we only have three people that can get into our drug vault because, you know, we are a university and we have limited um, amounts of, of drugs for our DA registration, so that was a little complication, but uh, we are ready to ship out the plant materials next week to the core group and then hopefully in the next week or so, send it to anyone who's going to make a request uh, through the tap code. Has there been a lot better attendance in that building? <laughs> That's right. Everybody's still in the Any questions about What decision point with, with your process? We're using a 1% cutoff. Cut yeah. And um, when we were using a non-deuterated um, <coughs> approach, we were using a 2% cut off that we've been able to remediate those issues by switching the internal standard. So the, the downside, one of the reasons why the group was not enthusiastic about using deuterated initially is it, it drives up the cost of the analysis dramatically. But I think, um, again, kudos to the, um, the, the folks that were the, the decision makers. We have just facilitated, um, we presented the data and we let the labs decide what they wanted to do based on our data and our experiments. And they decided to go with the degraded. It does increase the cost, but I think they were compelled by the improvement in the performance of the assay. And I think once we were able to show that we could actually give them the full scan acquisition, which they wanted with the benefits of 
I send for the decision point, they were pretty happy with us. Just um, just trying to figure out when do you think it may be a time when the lab can be doing it? So that is really a question for the labs themselves because I think it's we can work faster than they do. I mean that's the reality. So between Jessica Chen, who's really done most of the heavy lifting on this, especially since um, since the summer. Um, we can generate the data and we can pr produce our validation data much faster than, than they can because they're operational apps. So um, I, I read in the news that this will be done in March, so I'm assuming that's what I'm doing. Um, and I think, I'll defer to the labs, but I think that's very doable. James is looking at me as if I'm crazy, but that's what we're shooting for, right? He's nodding his head, either like, yes, I agree, so, or I'm going yeah, to kill so you. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that is our goal, but yeah. in March is a full month, so when you say in March, I'm naming it in March, yeah, right. not right. Right. before right. spring break, right. after so spring break. March is ambiguous, right? Yes. So, yes, yes but yes, we are no. definitely <laughs> shooting what we are shooting. Yeah, the only other thing that's already standing up, I don't want to really say is Sarah is not giving herself enough credit or the support in getting this moving forward. She really has been the whip of uh, the um, <laughs> guide and <laughs> on this project, helping the labs move forward. Because as she says, the instrument itself is not at all new to the labs, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to take this approach was that it's instrumentation that the labs already have available, just a newer application for it. And so in getting us comfortable with that newer application, she's been instrumental, pun intended, in, in doing that. And so I think, yeah, at least those of us who have the chance to um, work with her um, see the advantage in, in taking this approach and how much more robust it's going to be. So there will be a necessity for the labs especially the drug sections. That's the key here is we're not talking about the toxicology sections who are more familiar with this approach, especially the SIM application of the instrument, but your drug sections are probably gonna have to have a, a good deal of training in, in applying this, this procedure. It's nothing that they can't do. It's just something that they're going to need to incorporate that training time into getting the validation and everything online before they move on to actual case work. Yeah, and I think this is the benefit of having those academic industrial partnerships. And actually, this is why years ago we created the IFRTI at Sam Houston State University. So this is exactly what we've been doing for, you know, 13 years at Sam, um, partnering with operational labs or industry to take on these types of challenges because we have resources to do some of the, that kind of experimentation. And maybe we come up with... I know we had webinars where I think they thought my experimental design was crazy, over the top, not some. We're going through the statistical results of the ANOVAs, and I think um, at the end of it, um, you know, we've, the, the procedure is a lot more robust from that approach, and, and maybe when you've got one operational lab with limited resources developing a method and doing validation, um, it doesn't always, uh, doesn't always happen that way, so it's been a really good really good partnership. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to skip 13 at this moment and move to 14. Let's see which I got brand design. Oh um so um I'm sure that a lot of you have seen reports in the news about um an exoneration involving a Harris County case. Uh, the defendant's name is Lydell Grant. And in the case, if you think about the discussion we just had about the Fred Lee case and the inconclusive versus exclusions, um, we saw a similar type of issue in this particular case, which, and then there have been a couple of other cases brought to our attention with potentially similar issues, and the issue is the following. So, there was a, a great emphasis in mixture interpretation on ensuring that laboratories 
understood that for data that, for example, fell within what was the analytical and stochastic threshold where everyone agrees that caution needs to be exercised, um, or for any profiles, that it is critical to analyze the data first, make determinations about whether it's suitable for comparison, and then look at the knowns, right? Because otherwise what we were, the common terminology to refer to, if you look at the knowns first and work your way backwards, is suspect-driven CPI, or suspect-driven analysis generally, whether it be CPI or <coughs> another statistic. And so the idea and what we sort of emphasized to the nth degree was that you always need to, to make determinations about your evidentiary sample before you refer to the number. And um, so that's something that a lot of laboratories have SOPs that are designed to achieve that result. And what we're starting to see is that sometimes what the labs would say is that if I look at a profile and determine that it's not suitable for comparison, I am going to reach an inconclusive finding for making an association, an affirmative association, but I'm also not willing to say anything about an exclusion either. So they wouldn't say, they wouldn't distinguish between whether data is good enough to make an association and inclusion, and then take a second look and say, okay, well, I don't think it's good enough to include, but is there something here that shows me that an exclusion is appropriate? Um, and so what we're seeing are case examples coming to us where the labs may have, have reached an inconclusive result out of sort of tremendous respect for this notion that we should not be doing suspect driven analysis, right? We shouldn't be working our way backward. But that some cases that we've seen, and, and Fred Lee is an example, though Fred Lee had other issues in it, um, but certainly Lydell Grant is an example. What we're seeing is that when, say, Dr. Badoli looks at the profile, or Dr. Coble looks at the profile, or other analysts. In, in laboratories look at the profile they'll say well that isn't that's an exclusion it's a clear exclusion it should this result should have been an exclusion and so what um, what we're trying to wrestle with here on this question is the gap between what seemed to be obvious to say Dr. Coble or Dr. Badoli when they look at the profile the gap between that and the practice in the labs which was if it looks inconclusive, we're not going to say anything. We're not going to say yay or nay, no inclusion, no exclusions. When we talk to prosecutors about that and lawyers in general, the potential impact of that is significant in a case. So say Jarvis is working a case and is considering his theory of the case and he gets a lab report and the lab report says, let's assume the piece of evidence is highly probative for the moment, right? It may not always be. Let's, let's, let's just assume for sake of argument that it is. And he looks at that and it says inconclusive. He's probably, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, going to sort of shell that in a way. Well, this doesn't lend information toward either theory of the case. We're just going to set this aside. But if the... If the laboratory issues uh, a report that considered that includes an exclusion, a comparison and an exclusion, that may cause sort of a reevaluation of a number of things, in, including potentially the entire theory of the case in some circumstances, not always, certainly, but it definitely um, in the mind of the end user, which is often, but not always the state, but often the state, those differences are significant potentially. Not always, but potentially. Depending on the fact, the other inculpatory or exculpatory case facts, depending on um, the significance of the evidence to the overall evidence in the case and so on. So because we're seeing this issue pop up in uh, multiple labs, 
not just DPS, but in multiple cases. And we've started asking laboratories, you know, how does SWIFT handle this historically? How does Bear County handle it? How does, you know, and what we're seeing is that there is variation across the state on this question of what data the laboratories feel is sufficient for exclusionary purposes. Um, and because we understand at some very fundamental core sort of professional responsibility level that this could matter um, in actual case process, case outcomes, um, the grant case is on the agenda as an example of that. And there are some other issues in the grant case as well that will probably follow at a later date. But Dr. Badoli and I have been talking, and we've been talking with the labs a little bit about this situation and what may need to be done to sort of figure out where the gaps are. Um, you know, DPS has already gone down that path with their Fred Lee casework assessment that Dr. Nelson was talking to us about a few moments ago, but there may be cases, I mean, the grant case is a former HPD case, and there may be other examples. And so it seemed like something that we couldn't just uh, set aside and ignore, certainly. So we wanted to talk to you all about it and get some guidance about what we might do. Well, to me, in my position, I'm more specific and better. I think you're right. If I have inconclusive, that is that kind of drives it into detail. If I got an exclusion, it should be labeled an exclusion. I would rather know that early so that I can wave off of that as opposed to possibly still advancing my theory of the case and not releasing and not uh, turning over to defense counsel what probably should be an exclusion, which would be Michael Morton slash Brady. <coughs> so I would like to know and to be clear, in the, in the examples that we've seen to date, I want to be absolutely clear about this point. The analysts are following what their SOP indicates they should do. And that SOP is created based on their internal validation. So, what the analysts, I think, are doing is embracing something that we, frankly, have hammered over the last five to ten years, which is be careful of this suspect-driven CPI. Be careful of, of this data in between AT and ST, and then, and then because you can't quite figure it out looking at the known and working your way backwards and issuing a statistic. I mean, we have been so... And it's, in, it's all over the place, you know, and so I think perhaps in embracing that, there's been a sense that by not saying anything, inclusion or exclusion, that's a conservative or a cautious approach when the truth of the matter is it may not be if there is sufficient data and the question of what that is is critical but if there is sufficient data and a profile for exclusion an inconclusive result would not be either cautious or conservative if you're the defendant now i want to re-emphasize again that the question of what data is sufficient i don't think has been widely discussed now bruce you would know way better than me but I don't think there's a ton of guidance out there on what that is. Perhaps I'm wrong, so correct me. Um, if there is information out there, there may be a gap between where that information is housed and what the bench analysts have access to. So, and, any, and by that I just mean the gap between academic publishing and what goes on day to day in the lab, which is that you've got cases that you need to work, and you've got an SOP that you need to follow, and that's been validated by people who do validations in the lab. So I hope I'm being clear on what the issues are, um, and fair and balanced in the presentation of those issues. That's what I'm, I'm but Bruce, please 
I'm no, sure I've forgotten things. No, so. I, I, no I, I think it's fair. It's just, I think it's more about either how people were educated and trained versus your viewpoint. And it comes back to what is conservative. And from the scientist's point of view, conservative is looking at data and using it or not. And you say, I'm being conservative, I don't use it because there's some question. I'm looking at any reference or knowns. And others, including myself, would say conservative is, as we built the procedures from early on, is if you can exclude, you should exclude. And that, so, you know, you look at our first papers and that onward, we, we said you should do that. That didn't translate somehow into the laboratory system. And that may be for a lot of obvious reasons you mentioned. So the real discussion becomes what is conservative, and maybe we have looking forward, not the looking backward issue is how do we define that so people are on the same page. Now some of these things you can't give a list of everything to look for because most of these are low level samples already have stochastic issues and problems, but there are some certain fundamentals that could be used to help guide people to at least think about that we use when we look at it routinely, but they may not have thought about because conservative was don't use it if it's below some value. Uh, Dr. Stout, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Because we've talked about it ad nauseum. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've chatted a lot, and, and Robin's here as well. Is, so Lightel Grant was one of the cases that came through ours. Um, and as I've thought about it, you know, we've, we've done, I think, a pretty good job in the laboratories of mitigating the risk of suspect driven bias. But in doing that, we have, looks like, created a bit of a hole of a separate risk that applies almost to the face of suspect driven bias. So as I've, I've kind of thought through this, how, how do you now try and mitigate two separate risks? If I let somebody go at the data and that first pass through with the idea of now we need to go back to looking at the two at the same time, that is going to change the risk profile there. Is there some means of how we can structure this for the laboratories that we can do reproducibly, we can do objectively, we can do consistently between analysts, between laboratories, because it's it's... It's one thing to look in the circumstances as, say, the defense expert where you clearly have and should have the bias of, I'm looking at these data to see if I can exclude my particular position. Perfect. You know the framework of that bias. That's great. That's what's supposed to happen. But for the laboratory trying to thread their way through all of this, it's almost as if we need to have the review for the sufficiency of the data, say, if sufficient, carry on with the interpretive analysis. Great, report what you're going to get. If insufficient, it's a little akin to like what we do in workplace drug testing, that you get a positive result. It goes to a medical review officer that then seeks additional information to try and disprove the reason for that positive, and then what the client sees is a negative result. So you do the sufficiency test. If insufficient, it goes to somebody completely separate separate reviewer, I don't, I don't know what this looks like, but somebody that's basically naive to the original interpretation with the express purpose of going at those data to say, can I exclude? If they exclude, what's reported is an exclusion, not an inconclusive. If they can't exclude, then what's reported is an inconclusive. It's something like that, because now we basically have two very separate risks that we're trying to mitigate. Every decision, every report we make contain some level of risk. No result is a result that still contains risk. So, I mean, is that a fairly short version of the <laughs> conversation we've had? So, I'm not sure if, I mean, yesterday there was, yeah, so there have been examples given of, of other disciplines where data, like mm -hmm. latent Yep, latent prints, firearms. Very right, similar very similar. There. There's insufficient to make an affirmative association, but there's sufficient data to exclude. Right. This happens in, in other areas. Um, and, and frankly, I think it's happening in some of our laboratories right now. 
um, but not all. Yeah. And so the question becomes, okay, so how do we, do we need a two-step process or do we just need better instruction about how to go about it in the way that Bruce and Mike Coble did when they got that data and said, this is a clear exclusion. It's clear. Mm -hmm. Except for the thing of when Mike and Bruce got the data, they got both parts of it right right there. They're, they're looking at this as a post-mortem. It's, it's, it's a different view of things, which is great. How do we construct that to happen routinely in the laboratory that doesn't upend creating, increasing the risk of suspect-driven right. analysis up front? That's and a good, that's, very good point, yeah, which is that if you tell them to look at both at the same time, you just told them not to do that just for the last up. 10 right. years. So right. now, yes. But now you're telling them to do it right. for, for this separate For this purpose. particular part. And you I know got it. going to happen if you tell them to yeah. do that particular part. Other stuff's going to creep in. Mm -hmm. And I received a, a very interesting, and I thought, a question yesterday, which I often ask myself in my job, which is, is this something that Dr. Badoli and Dr. Koble can do because of their backgrounds, relative positions, publications, all those things that is not reasonable to expect from your average bench analyst. And I think um, the answer to that cannot be <laughs> that only Bruce and Mike can get to an exclusionary result when that is the appropriate He's result. But you know what I'm saying? Like that can't be the answer. Like we can't, we've got to do better. That can't be the answer. <laughs> Um, that, you know, so we have to figure out a better way. And I, that's the... Looking at it, I don't think it's that complicated. I really do think is people have been taught what they think conservative is. Once you get them to think conservative has another direction or parameter, they'll start realizing it because there's some the fundamental science is there. And you just give them a few examples. It's not a lot of different examples here that would get that. Okay. These are low-level data. They're variable as it is. You can't get a hard fast rule of numbers. There's some very easy science, and at some point when it comes, we can go in, come down to Houston and show examples. And I think very quickly, yeah, come down and see the new place. So, come on. Well, I'm going to take the uh, Sarah's advice. We're just going to send everything to you. We <laughs> wash our hands of it after that. This is much better. Way to do um, no, I, I don't think it's as as big a leap, it's just people haven't been taught to think that way or to evaluate it that way. Once that happens, it, it'll be very obvious, I believe. So, here's a question. What, what should we do? Should we have some form of go-to meeting type thing where we bring the labs in to d address this discrete point and then get questions from people? and talk through it or what with examples from blanked out electropharograms that don't have any associative names or anything. I mean what what do you think we should do? I think that I'm just I'm just expecting if the labs start thinking this, we'd be able to figure it out ourselves, to be honest, but we could do that. I know I would so I'm trying to wrap my head around what you're talking about. I would love to see examples with blanked out you know so so it there's no Sure. There. Well, I mean, and I think that would that would be helpful and I would suggest maybe doing that before you have a if you're gonna have a meeting, do that before so okay. that people can have time to digest a little we bit. Like now in the next meeting so you can go through it, Yeah. Okay. Conveniently we've got several examples right now. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we do have do have examples and some of them, you know, we you know, because that's one of the things you have to review. Um, so some, some can be done. Some may require doing two amplifications to evaluate. Some some may just be understanding what happens in the smallest size STRs, because those are the ones that are very key. So if you look at that, you can trigger everything else in the, uh, for the certainty of the exclusion. But yeah, because yeah, I'm thinking like a million scenarios right now. And I'm like, yeah, well, is, is it good here? Is it not good here? Well, that, and that's good 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 exactly yeah. going to happen from the laboratory perspective. You rapidly start going, well, what if the exclusion, that's the other direction, that I exclude the, the, the victim from a piece of evidence yeah. that placed the victim at that site? So an exclusion then 
Well, when you select an exclusion, advantage to typically this. when you have inclusions, it's probabilistic, no matter how you do it. Well, I'm just saying the circumstances of the case where <laughs> exclusion and inclusion basically become that's right. the but, flipped advantage to but, the defendant. But to the, the way you look at it to me is that's not as the scientist's decision on that. The scientist is supposed to give you the best answer. But then how do I design an SOP and a system that I can do consistently? I think you can. I, can't, I think you can be done. But I don't necessarily have <coughs> You don't have yet, but, but the only point is if you're going to make an exclusion, it should be unequivocal. Right. Right. So that should be one of the criteria, or the criterion to use. It's just a few things that would trigger that, I think. But there could be a million examples now. They're doing, in a sense, they're creating a whole, whole data set that could be useful for training. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's if it, I'll, I'll offer a party in Houston, whatever helps in the conversation, come on down, whatever we can do to help. First week of April? No, I'm going to do it. Yeah, but, but I think the point about, about conservative or not, I, I may, may have presented that incorrectly. I, I think what we're trying to say is that based on the way, of what we understand of molecular biology from what Dr. Fadoli has taught me, data insufficient for an inclusion may not necessarily be insufficient for exclusion just based on the way that we understand the performance of the various loci, for example, or other factors. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. And so the question <coughs> is, is that being incorporated into practice? Today, again, because people believe that conservative was, I looked at it, there was no bias, they looked at it and they said, it's inconclusive, they've done what they've done. And I think they've done it correctly under that approach. There's no, nothing about the integrity of the analyst to question the process, and shouldn't be. The, the issue now becomes, how do we move from where that training was to this kind of training to be able to help them? And they may know this, just they haven't thought about it, that's all. And I'm expecting most have do know about it, they just haven't thought about it. Because they haven't been asked to do so. It seems to me that this ought to be worked in presentation to the different labs. We're not going to get there today. Right. And so maybe by the next meeting or even before that, something a little more organized on how to put together a uh, workshop, so to speak, for some of the different labs would be appropriate. And we can create artificial electropherograms so we don't have to show any real data. You know, right. you go to we have to go to meetings. Well, Vanessa, you could, um, you could also, from some of your examples, use the tool I gave you to create some electropherograms. Oh, yeah, the electropagogram. The electropagogram, yes, <laughs> to, um, to uh, get examples so we're not showing real casework data. And maybe we can then go from that. Don, did you want to say something? I just, I only just want to say that I do think it's a very valid consideration and concern. We have had this conversation for many days now about <laughs> potentials for co-defendants and you don't know who all, and victims and all of that. And, and it is definitely something that needs to be included in an eva in a, some sort of assessment of how to do that. This is only the 17th time I've heard this in the last three days. <laughs> and I do think from, you know, you think about the logic that gets applied here, we can't separate it too much from what goes on in firearms and lake parts because it's a very similar mm -hmm. logic. Well, but but so think think about this, let me give you an example. Think of this. They wouldn't do anything unless it was an ident, right? Insufficient. But if you had a, a print that was a loop, mm -hmm. And the person no, has no loops. That's an exclusion. This is, that could this be is we have this conversation in late prints a lot. Of Whether latent prints is was reported at all. Right. But this is this is this is this is conversation in latent prints a lot. Right. Of just it's it's thought sufficient about. for an identification, but it is sufficient for exclusion. And where are those lines? How do you go about that process so that you don't and trip I, yourself I, I, down I think the road you know this for you. Yeah. Like I said, we look at these all the time. And when I've looked at the ex these exclusions, it's it's very quick because you know what to look for. We just have to 
translate that to the other Is that explained as a toxicologist? I don't know. No, no, because I was, was going to say, Bruce, I'm sure there's, there are, it's even, even considering this idea, which I think is worth considering, but there are some profiles that you would look at and you would still say, this is uninterpretable. Absolutely. There's nothing I can do with yeah. that. I can tell you So that. that's like, well, that's what's running are, through my mind. Yeah, there are profiles, <laughs> that's why you have to look at yeah. the situation. And there are scenarios that trigger yes, and there are scenarios that say, walk away. Yeah. And it's just, it's a series of questions. Did this occur? And you go down this path, if it didn't occur, you go down this path. It's only because I've seen them, I, I know right. in my head. But you're going to show me some. I'm going to go, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And that would be, that's, would be the right answer. Since my job is to move us on, <laughs> we need to move on. I mean, we can, I think a, a something more organized has a lot of value to it, but I think we need to move on. Let's go to 15, which yeah, is the... Bob Whitecock, we have yeah. their phone. Do you want to do that now? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, let me see if somebody's outside. Uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals briefing attorney who's very interested in this and oh, oh, really? uh, not here. Okay. <laughs> not right, well. If you want, Bob, we can play. Well, we can play this if you want. Yeah. I'm uh, just trying to move through before we go to closed session. Oh, okay. Well, whatever you want to do, I'm, I'll we'll accommodate you guys. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you very quickly what this case is about. It's a DNA mixture case out of Harris County, a capital murder. Uh, basically, it was a young woman who was abducted from the parking lot of Cole's department store. Uh, they found her body the next day. Duct tape was wrapped around her head and around her wrists. Uh, she had been shot. Uh, suspicion was on the defendant, Theodore Schmidt, uh, because he was seen on a store videotape at the Cole's store uh, looking repeatedly in her direction. It was established that he had known her in high school had followed her up to Austin, uh, to UT. He couldn't get into UT, but he was at ACC. But he had, there was some stalking involved, basically. And so attention focused on him. Um, they found weapons that were arguably associated with the crime in his apartment. He was convicted of capital murder. So the murder was circumstantially based, the evidence. Uh, but there was a lot of forensic evidence. And so that evidence was presented at trial, and then we got uh, reanalysis through the Institute of Forensic Science. Uh, I went out there with a member of my staff last week. We met with uh, Mickey Pierce and with uh, Katie Welch and Dr. Kahn and with Gerald Doyle and the Conviction Integrity Unit at the DA's office. So what I've done here is I just put a few slides together with regard to some items, and I'll tell you what relevance they were, and then the different results from original trial in 2010 and the reanalysis that uh, concluded last month. Thank you. So the first item was DNA from the toilet seat in Schmidt, the defendant's apartment, uh, which they used to establish that she had, uh, without any reason for having been there, she had in fact been in the apartment. So the initial test results presented at trial, the FTR results, were that she, SP is the victim, could not be excluded as a possible contributor. Statistics given were 1 in 111,000. Uh, the recent results concluded that she could not be excluded, but was only 1 in 9. So that was quite a, a big difference. Um, second item uh, was a piece of paper that had been found attached to the duct tape that was binding the victim's wrist when she was found. The original STR result, he could not be excluded, one in 509,000. That's what was presented to the jury. Uh, amended STR result, inconclusive. Uh, there was Y STR testing done originally that was found insufficient to develop a profile. <coughs> now recently they did likelihood uh, they got a likelihood result, or they did not. Insufficient information for testing. Next item, uh, there was a swab from the actual tape that was around her wrist. Uh, original STR result, he could not be excluded, one in 8,000 and change. Uh, amended STR result, well, back to the original results, they did YSTR testing, he was excluded from YSTR testing. Two unknown males were detected. So recently, the amended STR result, mixture of three people, major contributor could not exclude her, which you would expect. The minor contributors, inconclusive. So it went 
in the yellow, 8774 to inconclusive. They did the YSTR testing, no conclusion possible uh, as to whether it was from two or more than two. Uh, insufficient information found to get a likelihood ratio result. Can I ask there, a question? Yes. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so let me clarify. Anything with the likelihood ratio, so the original report was from profiler co-filer kit, which we cannot do star mix on that data. So anything like they had to recut, those are different samples. So no star mix was done on the old stuff. So I just, that is important because some of those, you will get a likelihood ratio probably. So anything likelihood is new cutting meaning. And the DNA was, there was a lot less in the recutting and the data. So this means there was no analysis done by Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I didn't it's see this. It's just something different, you know. Right. I, I, yeah, I, these I, are my words. That's his, no. I didn't see Oh, well, then we know where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our reports were very clear when there was a different cutting. It just wasn't, uh, there wasn't data there, too. Uh, yeah. okay. It's just Thermix can be done with Troco stuff. <coughs> so you need to separate language. out the, the likelihood <coughs> ratio. It's, just not, it's not your language. From the right? original, exactly. So just to be clear and transparent here, there was also a result that went worse. Uh, original STR results on the scrapings from under her fingernails, uh, he could not be excluded from YSTR testing. He was excluded as a major contributor under the STR, but the YSTR is 1 in 13, pretty low, but uh, uh, the new YSTR result, he could not be excluded, and it went up 1 in 1,489. Um, so he was excluded from STR testing, but YSTR, from what is pretty important evidence, uh, does not exclude him. Now this, in, this, this next piece is important. Uh, there was a swab taken from the victim's left breast. Original STR result, he cannot be excluded, 1 in 74.15. Amended STR result, inconclusive. So you've now got like four pieces of evidence that arguably went to the other the other way, at least to a lawyer. You know that seems like the obvious um, conclusion. They did uh, star mix on this, and the result was that assuming her as a contributor, the mixture is 62 times more likely to have originated from her and the defendant, and from her and someone else. Now, uh, and I asked uh, Mickey about this and, and Katie when I went out there. The the uh, what do you call it the verbal scale or how whatever verbal interpretation is put on this that IFS uses uh, puts this in the category of limited support proposition that the defendant is a contributor but if you look at uh, that number were reported by DPS I think they come up with a different uh, category that it would be inclusive uh, which. But you're not and, you and don't maybe use that anymore. Not anymore, though. <laughs> not anymore. Well, see, I now it would be an inclusion uh, with a cautionary mm -hmm. statement. With a caution. Okay. See, I just said that. Um, that was a new. Swap. That was the other swap. It's just not a big Are any of them just an amendment report, or are they all new swaps? So we issued two reports. One was an amended with the reinterpretation of the old data with the current SOPs. And then there was supplemental report for anything that was recut, and they were able to do star mix. So, so was there any on the amended report that was with the new SOP? Was there anything that was substantial or significantly different? However, we want to define that in the interpretation. Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of the the original a lot of the original conclusions went to inconclusive. Um, it was not excluded in all of the, I think, I mean, maybe it was more than that, but it was usually one to inconclusive, the Y went up on one, and then the ones that were recut again, most of the star mix. There were none where he had originally been excluded and now included. Right, um, oh, correct. I guess that's the last one. Yeah, I only put the ones that were relevant yeah. to the discussion here. but. A couple of interesting things about the case. There's some really interesting legal issues here. Uh, 
we probably will follow post-conviction red. There's an interesting issue as to what, whether this constitutes originally false evidence, which doesn't mean intentionally false or anything like that, or whether it's just changed scientific evidence. One thing I didn't put up here is that there was also an expert that tried to put her in his apartment through the use of dog DNA, uh, saying that dog hair is found in his apartment. The DNA was identical to hairs <laughs> plucked from uh, her dog. And the DA made a lot of that in the closing that, you know, held up a picture of the dog, and the dog said, you know, told you. Uh, and of course, uh, there's the issue there. Uh, as I understand it, about testimony from somebody working outside an accredited lab about a discipline that has no accreditation. This was back in 2010, although I'll talk to Bruce about that. So you've done some K9 DNA. Well, there's a lot of I, There's a lot of it. Because I may see like some of that too, but, um, but um, there, are, there are remarks, but you have to make sure the statistics are done correctly. Right, okay. It's got other factors to it that the value to be overrelated to, if you know, to Right. So the final thing I want to say about this is that despite all the forensic stuff, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence too. And what we found in a lot of these cases is that the DNA mixture evidence is very often sort of akin to fingerprint evidence. It plays a supportive role, but is seldom the linchpin in the state's case. And in this case, um, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that seems to have gone to inconclusive. So the cumulative weight of it may tip the balance. So one thing that we didn't talk about in the last agenda item, but that has started to happen just sort of informally that we want to talk about, perhaps formalize, is that oftentimes when things like this come back, just by virtue of the fact that the community is small, we end up calling UNT and asking Bruce to take a look at the data and provide some sort of information to the parties on both sides about what he believes the significance is, what things should be done from here in terms of follow-up and so forth. And so I think having that kind of resources, that sort of resource for formalized for lawyers would be helpful. So that's another thing we want to talk about in the context of some of these cases, whether it be reinterpretation cases where people are trying to understand what's the significance of these reports that I just got back, what's new cuttings, what's a reinterpretation of old data, what's, you know, so it seems to us that the University of North Texas, so CHI, has taken on that role just by virtue of the way these cases normally play themselves out. But it'd be nice to have a way to do that that is collaborative in nature, even though our system is adversarial. And Don has done that in, in the Nolly case, for example, in Tarrant County. And now that she's at the lab as their lawyer, do you want to talk a, a little bit about your vision for how that might work? I mean, it's still trying to figure out what might be the best model that fits everybody because of course everybody's going to be suspicious on both sides anyway but um, maybe something trying to to put together exactly the kind of model that we have done when you're in a conviction integrity unit or an innocence project of working together of sitting down with the analysts together of everybody being given the same information of, begin, of being given training and the opportunity to know you know the details on the defense or the prosecution um, where you're getting the same sort of one-on-one -on -one training that like I was so fortunate to have by virtue of being in my role at CIU and then having lawyers that can maybe help translate on some things and so trying to come up with something similar to the collaborative CIU Innocence Project method in post-conviction cases to where uh, we can have those conversations and have some sort of agreement. Gerald can speak to this too, and so can John. But you know, like we have an we had an agreement at the DA's office that we entered into, to where everybody was working towards the truth on it, and not necessarily just advocating. Um, but we're still trying to work out the details, put together like a, some, some possible models for that. These would be on cases where the DNA is is not straightforward necessarily where it can be fairly complex or 
you know, where certain historical ways of interpreting evidence uh, may benefit from a review by someone like Bruce or Mike to red flag issues that may require additional follow-up. So our hope is that it would be a resource for everyone. I don't know, Gerald, if you... Yeah, I would just say briefly and go back to item 14 but the grant case, but I just want to give a shout out to Lynn uh, and your commission. I mean, frankly, uh, we were puzzled by so the DNA, uh, the DNA data was sent off to a lab outside of Texas. We weren't sure about the validity of the science, how good it was. Uh, we reached out to Lynn. She put us in touch with Dr. Bedoli and also Dr. Koval. And it was their reanalysis uh, that gave us the comfort level we needed to uh, feel confident that we did have a, an actual alternative suspect to go after that resulted really in, in our agreed findings for uh, Lido Grant's actual innocence and now murder charges against that, that suspect. But the lesson learned from the Grant case was a tremendous resource for the field, uh, frankly, that you all are to us as a commission, and in particular the University of North Texas Science Center um, in this situation. So we, we, we really are looking forward to sort of working with you and coming up with some sort of model that doesn't exclude obviously the labs that are so critical to us in our county and whom we rely on uh, tremendously for, the, for all the reasons that we should. Uh, but in this situation, uh, you all played a critical role and, uh, and, uh, and led to a great result, so thank you. So what we're gonna try and do is push through um, what we have left, go into closed session at the end, come back to open session, and during that time, that's where we're gonna have our lunch and anybody else who wants to come back uh, can do so. So number 16, DNA training. Uh, so we have on, we're planning a DNA training at Bear County in March. They approached us, the DA's office, because a number of years back we had done a DNA mixture training when probabilistic genotyping was first being uh, brought online by DPS and uh, they want to do it again. It's going to be prosecutors, defense, and judges in Bear County. And the model that we're using is something that actually came out of a training that Dawn did in Tarrant County because she had a training that was a couple days long. Peter was there, I was there. There were lots of people from the labs there. And it was 350 people, law enforcement, prosecutors, and it was a it was a traditional presentation of material. So trying to go through logically and pick areas of interest and giving, uh, you know, traditional PowerPoint presentations. And, and I was there and I watched and the DNA analysts did their absolute best to dumb it down to the dumbest possible level that, and still, they said it was too complicated. <laughs> And so what we're going to do is, and from that, we were in the hallway after Brady and Don and me talking about, like, what can we do to get through to lawyers on these things? Because if we don't get through them, we got a problem. And so we, so Don's... Like a covering book or <laughs> 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 and so what we decided was that we should do a, a model where we take one case, an invented case, and Robert and I have been working on this using his many years of memories of various cases that he's been involved in and then things that we've seen and we're doing an amalgamation of, it's a fake case that has elements of different cases we've seen and they're going to be trained with the various uh, DNA processes through the case from when the crime is committed all the way to a chapter 64, which will be at the end of the day. And so we'll talk about, you know, the serology process when we introduce the beginning of the case facts, and then we'll go through the various things. But this is all DNA focused, and we're going to roll it out. It's going to be at the end of March, and we're hopeful that it will go well. Bear County's lab will be driving a lot of this because they're the primary um, uh, forensic service provider for that county, but DPS will also be involved. So we're 
excited to see how that goes and whether we can get it to sink in by using an actual case scenario. Any questions about that? Okay, number 17, update from the uh, Texas Attorney General's Government Law and Liability Conference. So I already talked about this a little bit, but we went to that conference and have um, sort of created a list of things that, that we think like, we can do better in our policies and procedures or in our rules based on some of the presentations. One of those things was being explicit about video conference rules, we did that. Um, so we will be reflecting on that and may come to you with additional suggestions over time. Is there anything else? Yeah, I have a little list of things that we're hoping to incorporate this year for you all. Everyone has to take a contract training that we weren't aware of. And so I'll send you all a link to that. But it's uh, hosted by the Comptroller's Office. And it's just a required training for any governor's appointees. Contract training? Mm-hmm. About how not to take That sounds exciting. Yeah. Procurement um, rules. Yeah, even though we don't have any Oh, sure. How long is that? I don't know. I looked it up, but I think it was a long it is. It's quite a long time. And you can do it. You don't have to do it now. In one day, you can spend six months looking at it for five minutes at a time. Um, we also are going to develop a document that describes the rulemaking process better for you all. Um, we're supposed to have something on file that helps everyone understand the timeline of the rulemaking process. And Lynn and I internally developed a better timeline for ourselves, um, incorporating sending the rules to the governor's office and then putting them before you. Um, we'll also, we also need, we used to have one of these, but we need to develop a new training manual for the mission. So those are the main things we'll be working on. Yeah. All right. Uh, next is the uh, kit backlog reduction effort. Did you, Dr. Downing, did you want to show us some kits? Sure. So this is really exciting because we started getting our new kits in. Um, starting September 1st, the barcode tracking went online. And so at first we were just using uh, coding that we were getting um, from DPS. Um, but now the boxes are coming here, so if anybody wants to look at the two boxes that have the kit tracking numbers right on them. Um, I think what's really exciting about this is that um, we can track where they're shipping directly from the manufacturer. So now we'll know where every kit is in our state, not just the ones that get submitted. So we, that's really exciting. Also, I've been tracking data with um, communicating with Rebecca B at DPS and the Attorney General to check for the last, since 2015, the number of sexual assaults that have been um, reported to law enforcement. But actually, and the number that I've been going with, it seems like the best proxy for how many um, hits are being done is the number of OAG exam reimbursement requests, because you can't get reimbursed unless you um, have a kit. And so there's a, um, a motive. For the uh, hospitals, they want to get reimbursed. So I'm using that as the best proxy of how many kits are being done. And then the number that are sent to DPS for processing is about half of those that are reimbursement requests. So, but I can only track DPS labs. So we know a lot are going to non-DPS labs. And we haven't had a really good way of knowing like where they're going and what happens to them after that. And hopefully the half that aren't going to DPS are being submitted somewhere, but we really haven't had to correct that until now. So I'm really excited to see what the 2020 data will look like, because then we'll be able to actually know where they're going and how many are, are being processed. But the feedback we've gotten from the lab is that they really like, especially these little stickers, go in the boxes, um, the swap boxes, so the transcription area, it's easier for them to read, and so it speeds up the process. As far as backlog goes, Rebecca B has said that they've been meeting the 90-day window. If you want to, um, yeah. So else. with the passage of House Bill 8, really labs in the state of Texas are being asked to process their kids, mandated by statute, to process them within 90 days. Um, that doesn't start till January of 2021. Uh, we chose to go ahead and start that September 1, and it gives us about a year and a half to perfect that. And so we're not 
out of whack on the statute if we don't get 90 days, but we are certainly tracking that through this next year and a half to perfect our ability to track it in 90 days. Um, and we are. Uh, so we've got a couple one-offs uh, that we did make 90 days, but predominantly everything that has been submitted after September 1 is being completed by our laboratories in 90 days. Uh, where our backlog is, is kits that we had on hand prior to September 1, and that's where we're partnering with UNT and doing some other outsourcing to eliminate that backlog. And then we're also keeping up with crimes against persons as well. So that's um, really significantly different. So we were waiting sometimes two years, I think, in Brazos to get some of those uh, DNA results back. So it's been really exciting. I have four hard copies of the protocol in case somebody really likes paper copies or those of the updated protocol. And the, the governor is working on the appointments of the statewide sexual assault task force. There are a number of them that um, will impact our community, Dr. Badoli. <coughs> Who from? Um, so Dr. Amy Castillo, who's vice president of HFSC, mm -hmm. is the appointee for Tech Lab. And then um, Stacy Mitchell Stacey. also, I know, was appointed from a &M, who's a nurse examiner there. She's she's my board chair. And then um, TDC. You're going, you're on it too? The survivor task force? Yes. Yes. All right, so we're, we're very well represented there. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing how that goes. Right, update on the Rio Grande Identification Project. <laughs> All right, so, okay. So we have, we, we now instituted a program, that, although nobody knows about it, that's the nice thing. Um, we've actually had a talk with one of the NGOs who's, uh, we're going to send in what the submission forms are, what are the policies in place to protect privacy and security, and, and the nature of what's really important to them that it's a standalone, non accessible by law enforcement database. So we, we anticipate that it goes well to start getting some samples to start searching in this next quarter. Hopefully. That's great. Mm -hmm. Super. Twenty is the um, NIST RIT working group. Oh, um, so they asked me. I got an email from NIST asking if I wanted to serve on a two-year-long working group on DNA interpretation and human factors. And I talked to Bruce about it, and he said that sounds like a great idea. You should do it. And so I said, all right. So I'll be going to DC once a quarter to work on that and the end result of those working groups is usually like a report that's about that thick. They've done one on latent tense. I don't know who else is on it. I imagine it's probably the usual cast of characters nationally. Um, but we'll see how it goes. So I'll be reporting on that as it goes. Okay. Uh, the AAFS. Uh, Robert and I are going to the Academy meeting. And uh, we will, uh, Dr. Ian Pretty is receiving a, a major award at that meeting. And it, for those of you who were on the commission at the time of the bite mark, uh, it's Stephen Cheney's case. Sure, sure, sure. He was our, I mean, he provided so much data, so much analysis, so many articles, helped me understand what was going on. And so Dr. Pretty will be receiving an award, so I'll be there for that. And then there are a number of other things going on that are of interest that Robert and I will go to. And he needs to go to a meeting in order to qualify for membership for next year. So I just wanted to introduce him to that meeting. And so that's glad to sponsor him as a fellow. Okay, then you have two sponsors, which I think is only the answer. Okay, the last uh, thing that we're going to be discussing is the update uh, from the Crime Lab directors. All right, we met yesterday. Well, most of them met yesterday. I was on the phone briefly. Um, we voted some new members in. We did an update around the uh, hemp analysis, and as Sarah was talking, there's quite a bit of interaction between TechLed and TFSC and everybody else in dealing with the hemp method. Uh, we also did an update around continuing effort to try and evaluate 
validate multiple products, multiple, um, well, both rapid DNA instance as well as direct to DNA or direct to AMP products uh, between IFS and HFSC. We've made small progress, <laughs> very small progress. Um, and then I think the other big thing was some discussion around uh, trying to collect more what laboratories are starting to need at see as legislative agenda items for the upcoming session. Um, so certainly, it's not too much laboratory left here other than us. Um, anything that they see that maybe needs the laboratory in the next legislative session, let me know. Um, ones that we've already started discussing is you know, there's an effort with DPS and with the sexual assault kit tracking that there's components there to track CODIS hits and how CODIS hits move around the state and are used. I think all of us see a real advantage and necessity for that. So if there are resources that we can seek to help with that along. Um, and then all things trying to fix the circumstances around hemp marijuana what that looks like. And I'm, honestly, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to tell what the legislators are trying to do to fix that. Um, it needs something. But those are big things. Any questions? Tech lab? I think I just want to make, make one point of clarification. I think everyone who's in an operational lab understands that, that they will need a DEA 222 for those materials to be transferred. Okay. But I realize that folks that aren't from that background might assume from what I said that anyone who requests marijuana for a set use is <laughs> even will start FedExing it out. So that's yeah. actually one of the reasons why we'll be working <laughs> through TACLA because the process of making those transfers on a 222 has to be written in a certain way to request those specific materials on their in specific our vault. Current so, form. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> not every Tom, Dick, and Harry will be getting marijuana from San Francisco. <laughs> so they have to rely on their own street corner for that. Or their local CBD store. That's right. Um, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Right. At this time, the Texas Forensic Science Commission will go into closed session pursuant to the. Texas Open Meetings Act on agenda item 13 concerning pending litigation to receive legal advice from its attorney under section 551.071 of the Open Meetings Act. All members of the public and staff are requested to leave unless deemed such as you should be here. And this is at 12.39.
So the, the closed session has ended. Uh, and, uh, okay. The closed session has ended. It's uh, January 31st, 2020. The time is 1.10 p.m. The commission's now reconvened an open session at 1.11 p.m. Um, I don't believe there are any motions uh, at this time for that. So we'll move back to the agenda. Uh, we've, it's the proposed agenda items. We've kind of covered some of that. Y'all will list that. Mm -hmm. um, the next meeting is scheduled at what time? Uh, 17. Same time, 8.30, if that's okay with everyone. April 17th. April 17th, and then the one after that is July 24th. Okay. And then, do we have an October? <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. October 25th, I believe. Yeah, because I was, I was trying to find out if I'd go to Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's yeah. right. We did talk about that. Um, all right, and so is there any public comment? Seeing that there is none. Public, yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you have a motion to adjourn? Yes, sir. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, that was the fastest second in front of the Not doing public comment. Well, we had a lot of people here until afterwards. Kind of, I think, held. That was strategic. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. No, I mean, and you don't want to make them sit through no. the whole time. Yeah. and wait on us. I didn't see anybody that was, that I thought we were going to have a public comment yeah. on. We have gotten that. Uh, and the fact that we let them we had public the comment yeah. we had public comment just out of order yeah. frankly okay okay yeah. well yeah, that was the weekend Sorry. oh that'd be great oh. <sighs> i guess you might be able to beat the traffic yeah. is it, uh, right? shut off then uh.